Okay, so I'm going to start just with a, a few little disclaimers, uh, reminders uh, that this is not a private conversation and will ultimately be made available to the public. Um, we want this to be an enjoyable experience for you, so if at any point we get into uh, a topic that you don't want to discuss, um, <clears throat> just let me know and we'll redirect to another topic. Uh, if at any point you need to take a break, just let me know that as well. My role in our, in our conversation is actually to talk as little as possible and to create the space for you to tell your story. Uh, I will ask some guiding questions, but then let you have free reign. Um, also, I might be looking at my notes occasionally, but rest assured that I am tuned in. Uh, so for our formal introduction, today is Thursday, April 11th, 2019. My name is Andy Reisinger, and I am interviewing Steve Seberg here in the Department of Special Collections and Archives at Georgia State University as part of the Great Speckled Bird Oral History Project. And before beginning, if I can just get your verbal confirmation and consent uh, that you're aware and consent to be recorded. Uh, yes, I consent. Perfect. So as you mentioned as we were talking before the interview, this we do want to record your whole life and be able to establish context and figure out not only your involvement with the Great Speckled Bird, but like who you are and how you came to be. So we're going to start at the beginning. Even I wonder about that sometimes. I think we, I think that's what we're supposed to be doing with this life thing. Yes. Um, so if you can describe a, a bit about when and where you were born. Uh, well, I was born in Evanston, Illinois, but my family at that time lived in Chicago. And on my father's side, I'm a fifth generation Chicago, and my great-great-grandfather, one of them, came there from Germany in the 1800s. And uh, However, we soon moved from the north side of Chicago to Evanston, which is a suburb a little away. Decatur is related to Atlanta. It's a big city in itself. And a few years after that, we moved to a suburb farther north on what's called the North Shore, where I really grew up through my teenage years and <clears throat> went to high school. Uh, and then went to college at Northwestern, which is back in Evanston. Uh, so I lived at home for a long time, commuting on an interurban, which is no longer in existence, with all the other kids from these various suburban towns on the North Shore. And uh, <clears throat> my parents, my father was a journalist, and my mother was an artist who had gone to the Art Institute School in Chicago. And my, her mother was a journalist who had been the second woman journalist in Chicago, starting to work for a Chicago newspaper sometime in the 1890s. Uh, the first woman journalist was also alive, and she had only been the first woman journalist for a few years. Before, so I mean, this was not so my mother, grandmother, knew this woman, uh, Amy, oh, I forgot her name, it doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, I did have a, I went to sleep at night listening to typewriters going all my life. And I finally married a woman who was also a writer and kept, went to sleep even then, later in life, to the typewriter going. Mm -hmm. So uh, my, maternal grandfather was a doctor of divinity, although I never heard him preach a sermon. I was mostly interested in the fact he'd been in South Dakota and knew a lot about dinosaurs, which I was obsessed with as a kid, like many kids. And uh, <clears throat> he was also an editor and a writer, but wrote books which were really the retelling of Bible stories, which are not that interesting to me as a child. But he did write one story which was a kind of guidebook to the World's Fair of 1893 called, 
something like Uncle Hezekiah and Aunt Hepzibah at the World's World Exposition. And it was both a guidebook and sort of an adventure novel of a family from somewhere like southern Indiana or Iowa mm -hmm. who come to the big city and of course one of them gets lost and because he had grown up in southern Indiana and knew exactly what these people were like. And the book sold a half a million copies, which was rather rare at that time that any book of any kind sold that many copies. But it's of course because everybody bought it that came from Indiana and Iowa and Wisconsin mm -hmm. to go to the fair. Anyway, I grew up in this atmosphere of pictures on the wall by my mother and typewriters going and newspapers. I mean, we took like five newspapers every day. Uh, and as, as the newspapers in Chicago would disappear the way they did or amalgamate, it became fewer and fewer, but it would still be two or three a day, morning and evening mm -hmm. papers. And eventually, I, partly to please my father, when I was about 23, got a job at the City News Bureau, which is a kind of AP for the local papers of Chicago. So their reporters are stationed in mostly police stations, the city morgue, uh, the county courthouse, city hall, as a kind of first filter of news. And if the news looks interesting, a paper like the Tribune or the American or the Sun-Times will then send out their own reporter to report it. So we were the first ones and uh, we sat in police stations and there were no cell phones. So you had to use the sergeant at the desk phone, which meant saying, I'm sorry, sergeant, may I use your phone? No. They're also operating a police station, so they're not too happy. So I learned how to get along with policemen. That was really the main thing I think I learned as a newspaper reporter. I only did it for a couple of years and quit because actually I wanted to be an artist. But it certainly was a, an experience. And working for the bird, of course, was a direct connection with having been a police reporter, knowing how newspapers work, and uh, for both good and bad. But the, the work for the bird was, of course, a real challenge because of its political nature. I mean, it was openly progressive. And uh, <clears throat> there would often be arguments in the editorial room, which might just be a, the living room of an old house on Juniper Street in which one person would get mad and shout at the other that when the real communists come, you will be the first to go. And I would sit like this at my desk, you know, not being either a Marxist Leninist, or in fact, there was a while that the paper was run by militant lesbians. And so as a guy, you really had to keep a low profile with these women who, uh, the paper wouldn't change that much because of it, but certainly the atmosphere in the, in the office uh, was, would be affected by it. And as long as I'm honest, I'll just tell a story that goes with that. Uh, there was a woman, and she still lives here, Dolores French, who had gotten interested in women not just sex workers, but say strippers, women doing that kind of work as working women. I mean, she was really ahead of her time. And I knew her because we all knew each other at that time. Like her husband had a, Roger French, had a band called the Deluxe Vaudeville Orchestra. And since I was also a musician, I knew them and met Dolores through them. So she knew I was now the culture editor. So she came in with a story about strippers with some pictures of them, really modest. They were nothing lascivious. And I said, sure, I think that's a, really a good idea. Let's, I'll, I can write something about it. And, but when the editor, who was a militant lesbian, found out about this, she was incensed. And I don't remember her name, luckily. 
but she really was furious. You know, this was exploitation of women, and we couldn't possibly have a story like that. And within a couple of days, and probably not because of that, she suddenly stood up at her desk in the office, we were all in the same room, and said very loudly, she said, she said I quit. And then she turned like this and looked directly at me and said, and it's because of you. Well, I cowered, you know, thinking you know, I'd rather have her quit than me quit. And she did quit, and suddenly the paper was back in the hands of Marxist Leninists instead of militant lesbians. There were other groups too, who I can't remember. But of course, it was hard. Of course, they were serious, but I was not there, you know, to take part in that kind of politics. I really wanted to see what, how culture was used politically, and if I, what I could, have, what, what I would have to say about it. I had read a book recent before that by a guy named Berger, which is the only book on art criticism that's really political that I had ever seen at that time, uh, in which you examine this as part of the political, you know. And it was just about that time that the Fox Theater became a subject of discussion because they were going to tear it down. And as an artist, I'm not for tearing down any edifice that's that interesting. But as a politically aware person, I had to see that this is a place that black people had to come up, only sat in the balcony, and had to enter by a, a staircase, a fire escape on the outside of the building. Not only that, but they had essentially stolen all this uh, Arabic deck decor from people that you could consider oppressed people. And I, and this is a story of my life, I felt it was my duty to tell them that. So I wrote a story about the Fox Theater explaining all this stuff, and they were again, I'm not saying that people were mad at me all the time at the bird, these are only a couple of incidents, I just thought of them together. And, these people who were such avowed communists and progressive socialists were also terribly romantic about things like the Fox Theater. You couldn't see this, couldn't see something that now is taken for granted. People now talk much more openly about the oppression and the culture of oppression of people. So I wrote an article about it, and they couldn't stop me because it was really it was politically correct. Mm -hmm. And it was an issue that was right there. We needed articles about this was an issue that everybody was interested in. But it got printed sort of garbled, like different. The way we printed the paper was the story would be printed on long strips and then pasted onto the sheets and sent to the printer to be made a plate made of. So whoever pasted it up, pasted it in the wrong order. So you had to read, you know. And I always thought that was revenge on me for the subject of this, was that it screwed up the order of the, but mostly that was not typical, but things like that did happen at the bird. And then there was a certain amount of hypocrisy the way there is everywhere about political ideas and so forth. But. I had a great time, like I would go to a meeting of the uh, the DeKalb County School Board, <clears throat> and so I sat there and sketched these people. I mean, I'd seen all my life, particularly in the 1800s when they didn't have cameras, and artists had to make pictures of everything. I mean, the Civil War was really, was its history was recorded by artists who made woodcuts of all things, of battles and soldiers. So in that, it was good. That's how my knowledge of the history of art really helped me. I saw this was something you could do. And so I made, here's a picture, first of all, of just some people at the local crystals to give you a 
idea what people looked like then. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then below are just faces of the different school board members. And of course, you look at them and you think, are these people competent? <laughs> and it wasn't me that made them incompetent looking. I swear to God that, that that's, <laughs> that's the way they look. Uh, I also did a lot of art for the paper. And here's a picture. It's really a sort of gray painting of sitting waiting to try to get food stamps in the food in a place in West End where you sat and waited to be called to see if you were capable of getting food stamps. And of course, black culture was something I knew a lot about, having just previously taught at Clark College. So the bird was not did not have a diverse staff at all. There was nobody of color. And I would, every chance I had, even though our city at that time, now under Maynard Jackson or whoever, was you know, run by black people. And we were not really recognizing that. And nor did Creative Loafing, which came along right after and uh, that was a failure, I believe, of all of these progressive papers to not be able to include this enormous part of the population. So I would, did the best I could to bring in that culture somehow. Uh, WRFG, which was sort of simultaneous with the bird, many people worked on both. The radio station. Right, which is still going, of course. And the reason they're still going is that they did recognize the fact that they now had to represent the total community, progressive community of Atlanta, and they still do. Uh, and I think that that was what kept them viable, is that they now, at least half the programming is has to do with African and Afro-American cultural issues and political issues. Uh, as creative loafing became very quickly a, just a paper full of ads for various things the way it is now. But it did put the bird out of business because they gave it away free. And the bird still cost something like 15 cents or something. And part of our job, Andy, even though you would be an editor, was that one day a week you would have to go out in your car and collect the money out of the machines that stood around in Atlanta, like on the corner of 10th Street and Peach Street, there would be a machine, so you would drive up with some sort of key, I don't know how we got into them, I think they'd, <laughs> and take, shake out the quarters or whatever it was. So we were all humbled, you know, a little bit by this experience every week of collecting the money. But it was the end of the bird because everybody, nobody wanted to pay whatever it was anymore. They could get creative loafing. Mm -hmm. Also, the era of alternative newspapers was over. It had already been over by about 10 years. But they didn't notice in Atlanta that it had ended. So the bird, and I believe, I really was, went about 10 years longer than any other alternative newspaper in the country. And partly because it had a kind of mystique. I knew about the bird before I even came here because of its name. Its name, of course, comes from a strange religious song in which the great speckled bird, whatever that is, is compared to the church or something. Nobody's quite sure what it means. And of course, it was one of the favorite tunes of these bands, like the Jive Ass Jug Band, their guitarist was also was our news editor on The Great Speckled Bird. So we were intimately connected with the folk music world. And who is that? Uh, John Jacobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and John and others in the Jive S, The Great Speckled Bird was one of the tunes they played. So even though nobody knew what it really meant, I, mean, I played it too, I played the guitar, so we all played the great speckled bird. And this, 
I see it as a kind of mystique around that name, that there was more to the bird, although nobody will ever know, than just, you know, being a, a leftist paper. <clears throat> it somehow is in touch with the southern soul of some, of some kind mm -hmm. like that. I haven't really thought about it so much, but it's an interesting idea. I'm really gone far afield now. I haven't stuck to your... No, no, I think that's great and gives us but a anyway, lot of... I did come from a journalistic background and art history, and I'd taken philosophy courses. So I really applied all of this stuff. I mean, I thought that was the idea of education. I really applied this stuff to working at the bird the way I did when I was teaching at, at Clark or wherever. I had also taught prior to that shortly at Northwestern and also at Rutgers in Newark for several years before I came here, just teaching art. But when I was at Newark between 66 and 70 was the time of the student rebellions at NYU and in California and at Rutgers in Newark, which there's little written about, but I came one day to find, see somebody waving the Af African liberation flag from the top of my classroom building. Rutgers in Newark is it's like, it's like GSU, it's right in the middle of town. I realized I just should go home, there wasn't going to be any classes, and then I saw it was one of my own students doing it. Uh, and I, of course, was one of the teachers who sided with the students. I mean, I, I'd always, I was living on the Lower East Side, and we saw riots there, lots, and lots of political unrest, particularly connected with the Vietnam War. So I immediately talked to my students about their, the draft and about dope. The guys were afraid of being drafted and going to Vietnam, and they were all afraid of getting busted all the time. And I realized I wasn't going to teach them anything unless I recognized that part of their life. Uh, so I was <laughs> very popular. And every day that I'd come into my office, there would be a joint there on the desk left by one of my students. Now, I did not smoke it and was not into doing such things and teach, you know, at the same time. But that sort of showed my connection. Another time, one of the students said, Steve, because, of course, they call me by my first name. I can't talk to you anymore because the walls are undulating. And I said, well, that certainly is a sign that we should stop the conversation. <laughs> so anyway, I came here directly from that atmosphere. So uh, into, and when you worked at the AU Center then, whether you were black or white, you could become involved in the politics of the time. That is. I campaigned for Maynard Jackson. I marched with Hosea Williams to the, what you call it, paper factory. You know, anytime you wanted to be in a march, all you had to do was join the march and you would be doing it. So, uh, the, as they say, uh, the struggle went on. Even here in Atlanta, we just moved to it. Uh, and the bird was, of course, a part of this in a kind of distant way. And I think that was why I wanted to work on it. And I had, at that time, I didn't have another job. So was, my wife would say, why do you work for a place that doesn't pay you? Well, they paid us something. But every week, it got less and less mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as the money in the machines dried up. <clears throat> well, I have to stop a moment. I, I, and you can ask me a question. Yeah, no, and that's great. We have a lot of, lot of terrain to cover and, and follow-ups. Um, but yeah, to go back and uh, get some specificity. So you were born in Evanston, and what was the date of your birth? Uh, September 30th, 1930. I was what's called a Depression baby, because the Depression was going full tilt, and so was Prohibition. Prohibition didn't end until... 32, and when I was a baby, my father, and it was legal, you could brew beer in your own kitchen, so he had a crock in the kitchen, but when I started to walk, my mother said, we can't do that because we don't want the baby foaming in the beer vat. 
So we'll go ahead. You take your turn. <laughs> yes. Anyway, yes, that was what was going on in in the U.S. at that time. And you said that you were born in Evanston, but your family was living in Chicago. Yes, because the north side of Chicago is closer to the hospital in Evanston than it is to any other Chicago hospital. I mean, Chicago is so big that mm -hmm. you're near, and that was the reason. And you talked about your, your parents. Can you identify them by name? Yes, my mother's name was Helen Stevens, and my father's name was Frederick Lowe Seberg. And uh, he was, she was of mixed sort of Anglo, Scotch, Irish, French. I mean, her mother, my grandmother's maiden name was Follett, her mother. But on my father's side, they were all Germans and Swedes. And it's on that side that I had my interest in gymnastics and athletics. I can trace it directly back to these people who are members of German Turner societies mm -hmm. in Chicago. Uh, so and my mother came from the south side, my father from the north side. So my joke was I was a mixed marriage because of these, you know, the people who lived on the south side of Chicago were seldom mixed with the ones on the north side for some unknown reason. But my parents, you know, it was prohibition. And I have lots of pictures of them with steins of beer in their hands and speakeasies and pictures of my father interviewing members of the, you know, the mob. And every time we would go to my grandmother's house, because the Germans and Swedes, even Swedish and German Americans celebrate Christmas on Christmas Eve, we would go to my grandmother's house to do that. And then the next morning I would have Anglo Christmas at home. So I had two Christmases every year. And on the way to drive down to the north side where my grandmother lived, we would always pass a movie theater where, where, the, where the gangster John Dillinger was shot in the street by the Chicago police. And women ran up and dipped their handkerchiefs in the blood. And I knew these stories. I mean, I was, I swear, I knew this at six years old. I knew that this was where Dillinger was shot by the police. <laughs> And so, growing up, and even in the suburbs of Chicago, you were very aware of Chicago's history of all kinds. I mean, like the Chicago Fire, my great-grandmother was a girl, and their house was burned down and during the Chicago Fire in 1871. And they buried a barrel of sauerkraut in the front yard to save it from the flames. And the story is that when they came back, it was cooked. And it was the only food they had. Now, I don't know. Once I tell these stories, I begin to think, wait a minute, you know. And they put the piano, because this was the musical side of my family, on the sidewalk to keep it from being burned. But all the sidewalks were made of boards at that time, and it was burned up anyway. Uh, so I. You know, I can go to Chicago and look at almost every street corner and have some family recollection or something, which drives my friends crazy. I have a couple of friends who are Chicago feel a feels, but they're from Milwaukee and they're very proud of their knowledge of, of Chicago. But I always seem to know one more thing than they do. You know, mm -hmm. like if they say, "There's the Lyric Opera," I say, "Yeah, my father was their press agent in 1932." and had to go to every opera in his tuxedo and stand backstage. So I grew up with that too, you know, it's sort of being, uh, journalism and the theater sort of went together. And there are, of course, endless anecdotes about the opera, which I won't tell now, because this should be about Atlanta. And you, you mentioned that, was it your maternal grandfather that was, the writer and had the Doctor of Divinity? Yes, yes. Did he teach as well? Yes, that's exactly what he did. When he he quit uh, being an editor for a Chicago public, publishing house and 
went to Southern, I think it's Southern Illinois, and taught at Ewing College for until he retired. But he and my grandmother had divorced very early. They were absolutely unable to get along with each other. And she remarried, so I had almost most of my life a step grandfather who was an inventor, which is not such a good, you know, that, you know, he, he invented some strange things like an automatic bookmark. <laughs> when you turn the pages, a little wire thing would flip to the next page, so when you close the book, this little wire arm was always at the place you'd stop. And it never, of course, took off. He invented a razor sharpening machine called the Razor Roll. I grew up with this too, this guy in the house who went in the basement every morning and stayed all day working on a, 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 Sorry. And had all sorts of... Uh, I don't know how to turn this off. We'll just skip it, of course. It doesn't matter. It'll pass. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's that. Anyway, he would, and actually, we, he had a lot of strange asses and big bottles, things that I'd never heard of. And, but I swear one of them was just bourbon, and I think he was spending most of his time in the basement drinking and not really inventing anything. But he he got me to, he, he rolled his own cigarettes with a little machine. We would put the paper in and then put some tobacco in and it rolled it up and then you licked or wet the edge and finished rolling it. So he managed it because I thought it was fun. He managed, the way adults do, they managed to get kids to do all sorts of tedious stuff. So, I mean, I would turn out a hundred cigarettes because it was so much fun to do this thing. But, I don't know, the influence on my life may not have been good, though. You know that this was something that was an acceptable, another, be quiet, another an acceptable thing to do. <clears throat> but go ahead, Andy. Anyway. So that was. I'm your, just letting myself go off and yeah, no, right. that's, think of something like that's that. That's the, the way we want it to be. Um, so your maternal grandparents had gotten divorced, and your grandfather mainly was a professor mm -hmm. in Southern Illinois, and you had this stepfather. And your maternal grandmother. She's the one that was the journalist to it. That's right. And she was really. And did she? Do you know what she wrote about? Oh yeah, boy, do I! She wrote two articles a day until she was something like seventy, which were what's the word? Syndicated by the Hearst Syndicate, and even though they didn't appear anymore in American papers, were appeared in foreign papers, and they were about beauty. And she personally, in my experience, had little interest. You know, and herself looking beautiful, she was a little realistic about that, but she was incredibly clever at writing, just sitting down and writing a two page article, which my mother would then illustrate it, would illustrate. So my mother worked at home, which is certainly good for me, both of them, my grandmother writing these articles, and she did, she wrote every day, and my mother making an illustration. So I watched my mother draw pictures and ink them in, and you know, if your parents can do it, you can do it. You know, it must be easy <laughs> to do. So I learned to draw just by watching her do this, and you know, was convinced I could do it too, which of course I did. And um, did you all live together, or you just? Yes, we lived in my grandmother's house. One new voicemail. And uh, because she, she had realized back in the teens that when she wrote articles about beauty then women didn't have any means of doing any of this. I mean they were truly trying to make they had cucumber cream. They were, there was no there were no beauty aids or makeup aids. So she started a business. She hired a chemist and her cousin as the business manager and they started 
making beauty aids, and she, her pen name was Madame Kivive. So it was called Madame Kivive's Beauty something, and she made quite a lot of money until others caught on, like Lady Esther, and big companies started doing it, and she couldn't possibly compete, and she had no interest in being. But <laughs> she probably made the most money of anybody in the family for generations by doing that. So we lived with her. She also wanted to live with us. Because I had, for various reasons I don't even have to go into. I mean, psychological reasons. She was very dependent on my mother as her only child, and mm -hmm. an almost reverse parental and child relationship, so it was important for her to be there. And I became, of course, a big favorite of hers being her only grandchild. And it became my duty as a teenager to make her mad at me, to show her I was not the nice kid that she thought I was. So finally, I managed to get her so angry she called me a little snot, a word that she would never use otherwise. And I was quite proud of myself and felt I'd been a big success. That, you know, that she... Uh... So we were talking about the you living with your maternal grandmother and her second husband and uh, her image of you as the the perfect child and that you mm -hmm. worked to disabuse her of that that notion. Mm -hmm. But also, um, so your paternal grandparents... My, what, my paternal grandfather was a printer, so I mean again we're <laughs> we're still back in the you know, printing and newspaper business and my paternal grandmother however was had gone to the Moody Bible Institute and was quite religious and I look back on it now and think that's why I had to go to Sunday school all the time although my parents never went to church at all finally at the age of 12 with all these little attendance medals I thought I am the only person in my family that trudges off to church every Sunday. I'm the one, in the, but it was very good because that would now related me to my other grandfather. I mean, although those two people had no relationship, the maternal grandmother and paternal grandfather, there was nothing. He was quite an intellectual, obviously, and mm -hmm. she was more, and it, but it was on her side of the family that the music came from because there was a story about, they came to Chicago and my great, great grandfather had a rope walk where you actually had to walk along a long line, twisting the rope. And so it had to be on the edge of town, town to have a lot of uh, space, but the edge of Chicago at that time in 18, whatever it was, 50 or something was pretty close in. Uh, but there was a family story that my great-grandmother, who was the youngest of three daughters, would have to work in, on the rope walk on Sundays. But her older sister didn't have to. Her older sister would sit in the house and play the piano. So she was quite mad at this woman, at her sister who got to play the piano. And I said to my uncle once, I said, what did she play? Aunt Mary, and he said, oh, the daughter of the regiment. So he knew immediately what was the popular tune because my uncle was a professional pianist. So my father also played the violin, but had become a reporter. But my uncle, for his whole life, was a piano teacher and a pianist. So I had this musical side of the family uh, all the time, too, which is what got me into, you know, playing with the jive-ass jug band and stuff like that. And uh, it all, I'm trying to make sense of this, Andy, you know, putting it all together. Did you take music lessons, or were you taught no, by somebody well, I did, in your yes, family? No, because uh, in, in school, we all got, if you wanted to be in the band or a choir, you could do it. So I was always in the choir or something in high school, and we certainly learned to read and sing music. And my father played the ukulele, and I learned all these tunes that he sang and how to play the ukulele. 
And I just started teaching. I learned how to play the saxophone in school, and little, and I taught myself other instruments. And we got a piano when I was like 14. And then my father got the idea that I should take lessons, and he would get his brother, his little brother, to come. And I'm sure do it for free. I'm not sure he wasn't. I just know it, knowing my father. You expect this of your relatives. So my uncle came dutifully with a whole armful of music and sat down and said, can you play anything? Which is really a smart way to begin anything. And then I said, sure. And I played the 12th Street Rag. And he just grabbed all the stuff and said, you don't need any lessons, and left. And I, it was a great excuse. <laughs> and I said, no, no, he, he already can play. Well, I couldn't really. I mean, I didn't. My technique was terrible. And so that was my last music official, you know, private lesson. But I later took tap dancing. I thought dancing was exciting. And because my <clears throat> my grandmother, because she was a journalist and a woman, and knew this woman who was the theater critic, the one who was the first woman journalist, she went to the theater a lot. And when I was a kid, she took my mother and me to the theater when none of my other friends all of whom were, you know, from Republican families, and I mean, it was uh, it was a suburban community where everybody was a doctor and a lawyer, and went down to work on the commuter train every day, including my father. But I was going to see these shows. Like, I mean, I saw uh, Oklahoma in its on the stage, and even though it was a Chicago touring company, and I saw endless musicals and. Really good. I saw Ray Bulger. I mean, I couldn't. I thought this was the coolest thing one could ever do: is to tap dance like these guys. So I started to study tap dancing, and of course, the tap dance teacher was an old vaudevillian who was waiting to, for vaudeville to come back. Mm -hmm. He was always waiting for vaudeville. But there was another culture, Chicago culture of, uh, you know, theater culture of tap dance teachers and. It was very popular for particularly little girls to take tap dancing lessons. And I was one of the few boys that did it. So in high school, when there was a bunch of girls who were going to do a tap dance number in, our, in the school talent show, and they wanted somebody else, I was the only boy that could tap dance. So this became a great way of meeting girls. I mean, if you want to you know, become a tap dancer, you'll certainly see a lot of girls. And I in fact, and ended up by choreographing part of the dance. It wasn't very much, but I have a picture of myself sitting with, you know, surrounded by this truly a bevy of girls in French maid outfits, one sitting on my knee. And I thought, wow, that was clever of me. How did I manage to do that, you know? And here in Atlanta, we had a circus show in which I was told I was going to be a butler. But there were going to be five, four women who were going to be French maids. And I thought, oh boy, here we go. I will be the butler with the French maids. So I ran out immediately to Atlanta costume and bought these little kits, a pair of cuffs, a little cap, an apron, and a feather duster, so that they all had one of these. And they finished off the costume. And we had this incredibly funny dance act ending up with some acrobatic stuff in which I did cartwheels around while they were dancing with the feather dusters, and it all <laughs> went back. You know, I'd been doing this for years. Nobody knew that, hey, this is what I do. You know, I do butlers with French maids. <laughs> and where did the, the gymnastics, did you study that as a young person as well? Yeah, my father was a gymnast because the Germans in his German relatives had been members of what's called the Turnverein, which was a national German movement which came to the United States along with the Czechoslovakian Sokol movement and Swedish gymnastics. So I started to learn from him doing high jumping and all sorts of stuff. And when I got to high school, immediately, when I saw some kid at Boy Scout camp do a back handspring, I thought, that's also a cool thing. I got it. So I learned to do that and became a cheerleader in high school. And a guy came back from the Navy who was a great 
gymnast and tumbler was our coach. And so I got off to a really good start in high school. And when I came to Northwestern, we started a gym team and competed in the Big Ten with University of Wisconsin and other schools. And I got pretty good, but I had to quit the last year because I was no longer being a student. I was like a football player. And athletes spend every afternoon working and they, they're so tired they can't do their homework and they, they can't, it's hard to get up to do classes. And so I had to stop that because I wasn't going to graduate if I mm -hmm. kept doing it. But it always stays with you. I mean, and I kept walking in my hands always, forever, and kept that up and then discovered here in Atlanta, I became the manager of the Nexus Theater. This is Nexus before the antecedent of the present Nexus, but its predecessor. And it had a theater in an old school in Ralph McGill. And for a couple of years, I was the manager of that theater. I forgot to put it in there. And with my theater background, I had been in plays in college and high school too, and talent shows. I was always busier in the talent show than I was in the chemistry lab, I think. And uh, so I got to doing that. And one of our last shows, we, and even Alan III, who owned the building, said it was going to be raised and kicked us out. And uh, so our last show, I said, let's have a circus. So we had an outdoor circus. And I put an ad in like creative loafing. The bird was long gone. And met a woman who had a circus school and just started it here mostly aerial, like trapeze, and so I joined it, and she taught me this stuff, and I became her first assistant, her first instructor, and with other people decided that we'd like to try doing hand balancing, too, not just apparatus, but, you know, climbing, making pyramids, and little by little we build it up until Years later, with this uh, local group that is now defunct, but called the Imperial Opa Circus, we were really good. I mean, we were making pyramids three high and doing, throwing people in the air and catching them. And that now is all gone. That's a period that's gone. But that's how I got interested in that. And I certainly liked gymnastics. It was much more artful than, say, playing football or being on the swimming team because I could sit in study hall and make pictures of myself on the parallel bars or make those things where you, you know, it's a flip book where you mm -hmm. flip the pages and the little figure was doing, you know, would do, instead of studying German or something, I was sitting making these little pictures of ac acrobats. So that's how that got into, the, into me, was through this family background, actually, uh, and through high school and, and college gymnastics. I, I, when I was teaching at Northwestern, I, I still had a letter sweater, <clears throat> which is a purple sweater with a big N on the front of it. It's like all letter sweaters, pretty gro gross. You know, it's <laughs> not. And I had a football player in my class, and he would come and sit in the first row, put his chin on his finger and go to sleep, but it was to look as if he was listening. And I was only four feet away from him. I knew he wasn't listening. So one day, and we were all wearing suits and ties then. This was in the early 60s. The revolution had not come yet. And uh, so under my jacket, I put my letter sweater. So there was this enormous N showing. And I came in and stood in front of him, you know, started a lecture, and he looked like this, and he stayed awake for the whole class. And, and you know, so I felt it was a great success as a teacher because it, however, the next um, week he went back to sleep and it didn't have any more effect. It's, but I knew what he was, you know, what his life was like. He was so tired from practice, he had no, he couldn't stay awake in a class in the mm -hmm. morning. <clears throat> So let's go back to wherever we were. Yeah, so the next thing I wanted to follow up on, um, you mentioned both of your parents and that your father was a journalist and your mother was an artist. 
Uh, first off, do you know how they met? You also mentioned that they came from different sides of town. Sure, they met. She worked for a commercial art company, which would be in downtown Chicago in the Loop. And he was there as a reporter, and these people would know each other that did art and journalism, and they would have common friends and meet in bars and speakeasies, and that's undoubtedly how he met her, mm -hmm. through various friends they had in common in the art and journalism world of Chicago. And you were an only child? Yes. Or are an only child? Yes, but I still am. <laughs> And after you were born, did your mother continue working? In yes, because she could do this work for my grandmother's article mm -hmm. at home. So one day a week, she would sit down and spend the whole day at her drawing board, making the drawings that would be sent off with, with, with the articles. So I would watch her do that, of course. And she was very good at making dresses with flowers on them and making it look like the flower went around the edge, you know. And I always admired that. And then I would get to ink in some of the flowers, you know, I would be able to fill in. The <laughs> and every year she made a Christmas card, which became an incredible burden, you know, because you can't think of what's the next year's Christmas card going to be. And she would tell the family to think and we could never think of anything. Uh, then one year she decided that uh, around the Christmas card, which is sort of cartoonish and amusing, it had to do with politics or whatever was going on, they were very clever, was a, a row of holly and holly berries. And that would have to have a separate plate to be printed in those days. So to save money, she we colored in the holly berries with a little paintbrush, and there were about you know, 20 of them in them. So every time you went by your drawing board, you'd dip, you know, everybody in the family had to do some holly berry coloring. <laughs> so that, what was good about that is I didn't, I learned not to take art too seriously. I mean, I saw all these funny things done by artists like a, one of my friends' had, father was an artist, and he did a lot of uh, chalk, pastel drawings of nature. He also smoked, so as he leaned over the picture, often the ash of the cigarette would fall yeah. onto the picture, and he said he just turned it into a cloud. <laughs> he just kind of like that, <laughs> rub it a little bit. <laughs> So that became my attitude toward art a little bit too, was that, you know, if you could get away with it, it would be okay. And uh, the bird didn't really have any art much. They had a f one photograph of the Holsey Freight Yard, which is now the piggy backyard, but it used to just be a regular railroad yard with coal trains in it. And this guy, Tom Coffin, who you could easily interview for I mean, We have spoken with Tom. He took the picture and he had, had climbed up the top of a floodlight tower and to do it. I mean, it was a great picture, but to have it in every week I thought was too much. So I started to make illustrations like the ones I showed you to get some art into the paper. And uh, that was definitely something that attracted me about the bird is that I now had free reign as the culture editor. I was really in charge of pictures and very few other people even had an idea of what picture should be or didn't have the picture. I mean, I think John Jacobs did take photographs now and then. He was writing mostly about police events and the city and the, and crime, that's what his specialty was. I shouldn't laugh about it because you think of uh, the bird, his crime stories, it was, it was very fun. We had a guy that covered the Georgia uh, legislature too named Neil Herring. Mm -hmm. And he was also pretty funny, but he didn't have any pictures either. There were never any pictures that anybody had except for me. And so when I would get a picture on the front page, I, would, I mean, a, 
an article on the front page, I could always illustrate it and have a picture of my own. So I'm sure in the last year of your birds, there are plenty of pictures of mine on the front. Mm. There was a there was a strange event. Well, there were lots of strange events in which Emory had in its library an exhibit called the Electronic War something, not seen, not feel the electronic. Anyway, it was the beginning of this kind of drone stuff and the government had this exhibit showing pictures of planes, which was then shown by Emory in their library. And of course, this is infuriating to all of us at the bird. I mean, what a, what a warmongering. And they were in a big reception. And the new library at Emory had a lot of glass windows in it. So we all went there and stood outside the windows, pressing our faces against the window, you know, making faces and causing a disturbance. And nobody ever came to stop us. We never, I guess, they weren't used to that sort of demonstration in Atlanta much, or Emory certainly wasn't, but so nobody ever came to tell us to stop. And it was, of course, we loved seeing these guys in their suits trying to not notice us there. And somehow this was also sponsored by Coca-Cola, which is another infuriating detail. So I drew a picture for the front page of an enormous Coke bottle, and then a bunch of people demonstrating below with signs that said, eat the rich. I thought that was pretty funny. And I don't know if that was my idea or somebody else's, but that was the kind of thing I worked hard. You know, I figured I really had a coup when I could get that on the front page. Mm. And back to your, your mother and this artistic heritage that you grew up around, did she formally trained as an artist? Yes, she had, because she had a talent as a kid, her mother sent her to the Art Institute weekend kids classes. So while she was still in grade school, she went off to these classes. And then after she had graduated from the University of Chicago with a degree in literature and history of religion. She said she took the history of religion just because she already knew so much about it. She didn't have to study because she spent every summer with her father in southern Illinois. And he did, he did, never had a church, but he was often the guest preacher. So she knew the Bible inside and out. And anyway, uh, she after she graduated from the U of C, she went to the Art Institute and got a degree in illustration. So she was uh, professionally trained. Mm -hmm. And your father, for his career in journalism, had he? No, he just started, I'm sure he was on the school newspaper or something like that, but he was not trained any more than anybody is in high school. He never went to college. He really wanted to be a doctor, but the money in the family went instead to his brother's piano lessons, which my father was never bitter about, which is quite amazing because it was really unfair. But I'm so glad he wasn't a doctor. It would have been, it was much more fun having him be a, because he met, I mean, the stories about Chicago and, you know, interviewing people in the underworld, and it was, it was too interesting. I mean, the, the whole lore of Chicago, I and mean, he would meet these, one crook once bought a house in the suburban town in Glencoe where I lived after Evanston. Never really moved in, and there was a strange fire in the house in which the top of the roof blew off. And the Glencoe Fire Department was not used to that kind of fire. <laughs> and they came, and the firehouse was only four blocks away, and they rushed over and jumped out of the fire truck. And, and then suddenly, to everybody's surprise, jumped in and again went back to the firehouse because they had forgotten one of those connectors, one of those things they put on the, forgotten it. Those things are usually on the side of the truck, you know, where mm -hmm. you, it's suspicious that somebody took it off the truck. 
So they went back, put the fire out, then went back to the fire station again, and the house caught on fire a second time. So obviously somebody was attempting to burn Phil Dandria's house down. Uh, he never got to use it anyway because he was arrested. He was already he was going to trial. And at the trial, my father met him and said, Hey, Phil, I see you've got some French doors in your front yard, you know, lying in the grass. Could I use those for, you know, hothouse for plants? And this guy says, yeah, he says, take him. I'm not going to use him for a long time because he went to jail for it. And that sort of story, I mean, if I become a storyteller, I'd heard enough stories like that from people like Phil Dandria. And when I went back to Chicago once, I met, do you mind me just telling stories? No. These are men. <laughs> they're really fun, fun to tell. My wife and I, when I went to Europe for three years, because I was in a really bad auto accident when I was 23, just after I graduated from college, and with money I got from the insurance, I lost the sight in my right eye, and had a, I really banged up. So, <laughs> with the insurance money, which was pitiful, but at that time it seemed like a lot. I went to Europe, which I wanted to do, because my parents had both been in Europe and lived there and worked in Paris, my mother doing the same illustration, my grandmother writing her articles, and my father working for the Paris edition of the Chicago Tribune. There were so many Americans. In and what years is this? 1928 and 27. So many Americans in Europe that two, the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune had Paris editions of the newspaper in English just for the Americans. This was just prior to the Depression, to the crash, in which there was a lot of money. And people like, it was the Georgia writer from, uh, I forget her name. Anyway, Americans went and drank so much they came back you know, on hospital ships. I mean, there was nobody there to tell them not to drink. Prohibition was going on in the United States, but you could go to France and, and really guzzle wine. Anyway, they, I would have been born in Paris if my printer grandfather hadn't died in Chicago and my father had to come back to uh, liquidate the business. So my mother came back too and they got married here and lived in Chicago. But they were all set to just stay and work in Paris. So they weren't married when they no, were in no, Paris? No, they were. They weren't. But they were a couple already. Yes. Yeah. My father thought he would go to France on a tramp steamer like Joseph Conrad and write. But one day working on the steamer and scraping paint, he decided he would buy a ticket on the same boat that my mother was going on. So that was an interesting part of my life, too. So I grew up with this terrific interest in France and Europe and Italy and Spain, and a really international uh, uh, viewpoint on everything. I mean, that I was ready to accept. I was really interested in foreign things, let's put it that way, particularly French and the culture of Europe. And I also knew that I had a lot of relatives in Sweden. I, grandfather was born in Sweden, and one of his sisters had stayed there. And my father had a pack of first cousins in Sweden, whom I later visited. And that's how I met my wife, was in Sweden when I was visiting cousins. We very quickly lost interest in my relatives and, and other people. But, and even at one time, one of my father's cousins was the mayor of Stockholm. Not an elected position, but sort of an appointed position for lawyers. I mean, it was not. But apparently there was a scandal at that time. It was probably in the 50s, <clears throat> before I was ever there, or maybe 40s, in the Swedish, in the city government, in which somebody was, of course, stealing money under my cousin's watch, but everybody agreed that cousin that Gustav 
was so honest, he never would have noticed that this was going on. <laughs> there he is. Uh, so that was my Swedish, my Swedish relatives. Nobody would notice that crime was going on. So that too gave me a, pointed me in, you know, to international interests. So my life is, I've really always been interested in languages and other cultures. And that I applied to things in the bird too. I mean, even to know that the Yarov temple is a, is supposed to look like a mosque and the Fox Theater is supposed to look like something in Cordova. Uh, you know, I mean, that fits in with art history and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that your your father, when when he and your mother went to France, that he was working for the Chicago Tribune. Was that the paper that he worked for for his entire no, he career? Never, he he never he... worked for it in Chicago for some reason. Well, a good. <laughs> The Chicago Tribune is just terribly conservative and always has been. And that was another interesting thing. My religious grandmother in musical was quite a Republican and so was everybody else in that kind of society, the German American and I mean Donald Rumsfeld comes from that same Midwest German in fact I went to High school with him, and you went to high school with Rumsfeld. Yes, he wasn't in my class, but his sister was. Mm -hmm. But these were typical. I mean, the North Shore of Chicago was a typical Republican suburbs of every city. Had these people; they were businessmen and and were hated Roosevelt. And but for anybody with any sense, it turned it was obvious that only Roosevelt and the Democrats were going to stop the depression, which had been brought on by the Republicans absolutely careless attitude. So with that, many families were split up over that. And I remember my grandmother, my maternal grandmother saying to her nephew and his wife through this step grandfather, that you'll have to leave. I can't stand you in the house anymore. I don't want to hear, you know, your Republican views. And, as a little kid, I was probably about seven, I ran to the door and held the door open for me, for them because they were such crashing bores anyway. I mean, I was bored to death as a kid to listen to these people. But my maternal grandmother remained a Republican. And, and uh, also, there was a very strong streak, as there are as many German families from that West Germany, where they came mostly to the Midwest, Many had been French Huguenots, French Protestants, who had had to leave France when the Huguenots decided to start, I mean, the Catholics started to start persecuting them. I mean, there, there's a province in northern France called Alsace, and right across the borders, the French, uh, the Germans, Alsace, which is the same name, and they all speak a dialect in both countries. It's a kind of German dialect. And there's very strong anti-Catholic feeling in these people that have been persecuted, even to the time of my grandmother in Chicago. So that when Kennedy was assassinated, which of course was a terrible tragedy for all Democrats, her comment was, thank God we're out from under the Catholic yoke. Yeah. And we all said, what? The what? Catholic yoke. So that went back, you know, a hundred, more than a, a couple hundred years, that attitude toward Catholics. I don't know what this has to do with anything now, Andy. I don't know. Well, we were talking about the your dad and his stint with the Chicago Tribune. Oh, yeah. And well, you I, said that he only... Right. He worked mostly for papers like The Sun and The Times, which are definitely liberal papers. Yes, he couldn't have work for the Chicago Tribune. And so we've, we've talked a lot about um, many of your interests as a child and the things that you were uh, involved with. Can you tell me a little bit more about, um, about your schooling? 
your school years. And getting out my notes. Yeah, I uh, I really like school. I'm intellectually curious, and with like I spent immediately was taken. I mean, Chicago has some great museums, world class museums, and I was taken there as a kid. And I can remember my grandmother sitting smoking, which she did all her life waiting for me as I ran around looking at dinosaur skeletons and stuff like that. So I was, and of course, we had an Indian trail marker tree in our backyard, a rare thing to have in your own yard. But this made me aware of the fact that Indians had lived on this property. And later, only in the last few years, I realize that what they call the Green Bay Trail that goes from Chicago to Green Bay, Wisconsin, not only was a trail that Indians used in historic times, but was originally a trail in which mammoths used, mm. who were then followed and hunted by the Paleo Indians, and this was like 10,000 BC. So there was all sorts of history around us if you looked for it. I was always interested in it. And also Frank Lloyd Wright. There were a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright houses in my particular suburb because he had thought of making a subdivision there and had started to build about seven houses. And as he often did, he got in arguments with the builders who didn't want to do the things he thought they ought to do. They didn't want to have a plate of glass butt up against a brick wall without, you know, what was to hold it. Anyway, so he stopped, but these houses remained, and many of my friends lived in them, and he had built a bridge, the only bridge Frank Lloyd Wright ever built, and the place was sort of a horse-watering trough, because this was like almost still the teens, people still had horses. He even built a little railroad station for the interurban, the only railroad station he ever built. And I lived with all of this as a kid. I saw this all the time. I had friends that lived in houses that are now famous. So Frank Lloyd Wright was always, we were always aware of what good architecture was. And I mean, the minute I got, I went on field trips in college, of course, to various things in Wisconsin with the interior design department, but was uh, I took advantage of those things to see Frank Lloyd Wright's work. The closest I ever came to meeting him was we were at his place, Taliesin, in Wisconsin. I wandered off, a little bored with the lectures about furniture and stuff, and found a little Japanese bell, and I tingled with it. I did that, and it went tinkle, tinkle. And almost instantly, a Japanese servant in a white coat stepped out of her room and said, please, he said, Mr. Wright is sleeping. So that's my only contact yeah. with Frank Lloyd Wright is I may have woken him up, you know. So, but we were, if, if you wanted to look for it, Chicago was full like any big city, but full of really historic and interesting things. And later in life, I actually worked at the Field Museum with my wife as an exhibition artist. So here I was, it was like the, the dream coming true. I, I had, we had the keys to the storerooms, endless storerooms. I mean, this is an enormous place that they're constantly modernizing exhibits, but it takes them so long that 20 years later, there's still an old exhibit they haven't gotten to. That they're gonna, and by the time they get to it, the ones they've been working on are now old fashioned. And mm -hmm. Ronak and I, my wife would, take our lunch break and look at things. And my favorite exhibit was in the corner of a dusty case, a little pile of what looked like dust and a label that said, remains of a cannibal meal. And you thought that? <laughs> it was like I could sweep up something in our, in our bedroom, you know, and say this is the remains of a cannibal meal. So, but I learned a terrible lot, I studied we were re changing the Tibetan exhibition. So they had taken out all of the Tibetan art and artifacts 
that had been there since 1916. This is now 1963. And they're all laid on tables to be cleaned and studied, but the Asiatic curator it, it knows nothing about Tibet. His specialty is China and running after other curators' wives, but I don't want to mention it anyway. The, so I decided I would learn what these paintings are, and I bought a book about Lamaism and was able to read the Tibetan letters as to what these gods were and became, except for, we had a, a Tibetan woman who did interpretation, but she was being used by somebody else. Uh, she was not working with the artifacts at all. But I was, so I learned so much about Tibet and Buddhism and particularly, you know, Mahayana Buddhism <laughs> and all these crazy pictures. I mean, they're absolutely nutty things of, you know, Buddha as a devil, endless kinds of devil Buddhas and many of them showing them having intercourse with their female counterpart. And so nobody could look at these stylized pictures and see that right away. I had to point it out to people. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> one day the director of the museum called everybody from the museum. These are all PhDs and I mean we have geology, anthropology, zoology, astronomy and we're all gathered in this very ornate office. And he of course is a person that knows essentially nothing about anything. He's a rich guy. But behind this enormous desk on the wall is one of these tonkas, all gold and everything. And so we're all standing there pretty much bored, you know, PhDs from the University of Chicago listening to whatever he's telling us. And I whispered to a guy next to me, the carpenter, because even the staff, you know, people are up from the basement, we're all there, the librarians. I say that those people are having intercourse in that picture up there above the president's head. And the guy looks up and he said, yeah. And he leans over to the painter. And by the, in, in a couple of minutes, Andy, everybody's standing looking at that picture. <laughs> Nobody's listening to that. <laughs> oh, God. Well, I don't know what this, that story has to do with anything. Well, you have to have a sense of humor everywhere, I guess, including the great speckled bird. But I got quite mad at you know, we had, even I got into arguments with people and, uh, about stuff and they never got into fist fights or anything, but there was, there were people in the editorial meeting who, who cried, crying because of something. I never, can't remember why, I won't name who they are, that's not my job. And, and you have not probably interviewed or will ever interview any of these people. Another woman that worked there was Krista. You must, what is her last name? Krista Brewer. Brewer, that's right. Mm -hmm. She's still around. She yeah, I, I've spoken with her. Mm -hmm. And Steve Wise, did he ever work there? He did. Mm -hmm. Neil Herring, I'm trying to remember. Doyle Neiman, do you know anything about him? He lives somewhere else now. He I think he's uh, outside of D.C. now. Alvin Burris is a person that worked there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we've spoken with all of these folks. That's great. Yeah. So well, what, it was the perfect place to work, Andy. I mean, when my wife asked me, why do, I see now why I work there. You know, it was like all of these slightly crazy things came together. I mean, the fact that we should write about the Fox Theater and that that should be an issue. And I mean, I really could bring knowledge to bear on a lot of this stuff, you know, besides having to go out and get money out of the machines, which I did not, yeah, I'll go ahead. My mind is now truly wandering. <laughs> I was just gonna go back. Um... <clears throat> So when you went off to school, you went to, to college at Northwestern. Yeah, but I stayed at home because it was within commuting distance. Mm -hmm. One year I think I lived on campus. But otherwise I was going back and forth on this same. But when I was a graduate student, years later I came back from Europe with a wife who also had a degree in, in 
library science among other, and religion, like my mother, that's <laughs> strange. And so while I was a teaching assistant in the art department, she was working at the library. And she worked at the library in my parents' town where we were not living. We were now living in Evanston across the street from the campus. And at that time, it was the time of coffee shops in which every coffee shop had somebody with a guitar that played Pete Seeger and stuff like that. And in our local coffee shop, it was me. So I would go every Thursday night and spend two hours at least sitting playing the guitar and singing. And uh, I got bored with that, so I would tell anecdotes from art history very often, you know, what Picasso said to, uh, to Gertrude Stein and things like that. And, only a few years ago, a guy called me up here in Atlanta and said, you won't remember me, but I was the kid that sat in the back booth at the No Exit Coffee shop when you were playing. And I said, I don't know. I think I do remember you. And I said, were you the person that came up to me in the intermission and said, I'm going to ask you a question and you don't have to answer? And I said, go ahead and ask it. And he said, can I laugh? And I thought for a while that this would be just terrible for me to say to this young man, laugh at my singing, you know, what an idea. But, but of course, I said, of course you can laugh. Half the stuff I'm doing, I'm trying to make people laugh. So he was sitting there all this time <laughs> trying not to laugh. No wonder it was difficult. But for the rest of the evening, he just sat and guffawed over everything I said and did. But he found me after all these years here in Atlanta. I mean, he's no longer, he's probably 50 or 60 himself now. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. And had you studied art while you were in college? Yes, I, I was an art major. I painted and made prints and made sculpture and also studied art history, which one had to do. And for some reason, when I was a graduate student, I also took a certain amount of art history, so instead of getting an M... F.A. Right. You got an M.A.? I got an M.A., mm -hmm. which gave me much more, many more possibilities to teach on a college level uh, than I... And then for some reason, you can teach art history with only an M.A. I don't know why. It's like the only discipline where you can do that. Every place else you have to do a PhD, whatever you do. So I was very fortunate, but fortunate that I did have this art history background, because that's what I was teaching more of often. Mm -hmm. I taught everything. I was often given a course that nobody else knew how to teach. Like they knew at the art department at Rutgers that now collage was very important, and collage had become anything. Happenings were a kind of collage, of putting in disparate things together. So Steve was going was gonna to teach the course in collage because nobody else knew what it was. So, it, so I had to make it up, you know, and, but I did know. I, I, it was easy because I knew all these people. I was living in the Lower East Side, and a lot of my friends were performance artists and doing all this often boring and strange stuff, so it wasn't hard for me to teach the art of collage. So uh, that, didn't, that, that I had no preparation from except just being an artist, and that was, that was fun. I did, after the rebellion, I did introduce a course at Rutgers called Contemporary African, African and Hispano-American Art. They had nothing like that. And that was what part of the student rebellion was about, is relevant courses. And certainly, that's why the black students, the, the, the SNCC people, were, com were complaining. So we had, I had students who were in SDS, and I had students who were in SNCC, and other organizations that nobody's heard of yet, and never will. So my department, <laughs> was more than happy to have this. I mean, it was like a gift from God that I was going to do this, and of course, I, I was going to teach it. And I had a great time because we had no textbooks of very level, and 
So I just took them off on field trips in Newark. Now, this poet Leroy Jones, who had been on the Lower East Side, had now changed his name to Amiri Barak and had moved back to Newark and started a culture center, a black culture center. So immediately, that was where we went. I took my students there, and of course they loved it. It was really exotic and different, and very few people visited that. Oh, they, I think they arranged high school trips to come in and learn about black culture. So I also found artists in town who were from places I'd never heard of at that time, like the island of Grenada that later became famous for the, you know, whatever war was fought there. And artists from Jamaica, and I drank endless cups of rum with these artists and had them come and give guest talks in my, in my class. One time I had some rum with this guy from Grenada and I drank a few sips out of it that's all I, and then picked it up a second time. In the meantime, it had eaten the bottom out of the styrofoam cup. The cup just came in the bottom and was gone. The rum had dissolved it. So anyway, the next year they wanted me to teach it again. I said, I will not teach it. You've got to get a black person or Hispanic person to do it. I refused. And they were quite upset because they didn't know any black artists or teachers, these guys, this white art department. Seriously. But I did, of course. I found a guy who <laughs> told me, he was a, one of my good friends from New York, that he had gotten it, he had gone to Morehouse. And little by little I found out he hadn't actually graduated, but that didn't matter. I told the art department, this guy, is, he's a poet and he's gone to Morehouse and he can handle this course. Then it turned out he didn't even finish his freshman year. He got into an argument with Morehouse, you know, and never. So I had managed to get this guy into a university now teaching an art course. It didn't even finish his first year of college. But it gave him a, rep, a rep, reputation. He went on to a kind of college teaching career. He later went to teach in a college in Texas. I can't remember the name of it. So it started a whole new life for this guy, you know, in, in college. And the students loved him because he was six feet tall and looked like a you know, his poetry book was titled Maumau American Cantos. And that's sort of really scary, the word Maumau to anybody. But when you then you thought, Cantos, what's that in there for? It's because he was an admirer of, what's his name, the guy, you know, that wrote Cantos. Ezra Pound? Yeah, Ezra Pound, who was quite a fascist. And so here Tom had this word Cantos, and to look at him, you couldn't believe that his you know, that this was, oh well, here we go. And I brought him here to Atlanta, too, to give a talk to my students at Clark, definitely. And he went out in the front lawn of our apartment over there and laid down and went to sleep. And as he was sleeping in the front lawn of our apartment, I saw our landlord go drive by and slow in his car. And it looked exactly like somebody you ought to call the police to come and take away. So I had to run out and say, no, no, it's a poet from New York. You know, it's all right. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Andy, please. And how, how did you, how were you meeting these various different artists and, and discovered, like, this Boy. course that you created in, for Rutgers on, Afro and Latino American art, like, how are you doing the research and well, just pulling it question. together? I can't. How I met the artists, I, I have to go back again to something else. Mm -hmm. It's sort of interesting, hoping that this will be an answer. <clears throat> Northwestern is a good school, but it's certainly not an Ivy League school, and lots of my Friends from the North Shore went off to Harvard and Brown and, and you know, and I couldn't afford that. And there was a perfectly good university in, within commuting distance. But it turned out that Northwestern was a good school and had, like many colleges, some very good faculty members, people who were outstanding. And one of them was the guy who was chairman of the anthropology department called Melville Herskovitz, who sort of invented, a, 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 he, 
he was a cultural anthropologist, and he was interested in what was called enculturation, which meant how two cultures blend when a group of people like Africans come to, say, Cuba, how their culture from West Africa begins to blend with Spanish culture, particularly, I mean, American jazz, jazz and all the music of the New World is a perfect example of enculturation. But also is this thing called the Santeria and the Kumba, these religious, what are thought of as voodoo, is that it's not just some sort of strange accident, but it's a combination of West African religion with Catholicism. And I discovered, and so in Chicago, I was a great jazz enthusiast, so I was, and I found people, other students, who were too, and we would go into Chicago, it was right there, and listen, it was the Dixieland revival and folk music revival time. I mean, I've heard Woody Guthrie and Lead Belly play in Chicago. I've heard Bunk Johnson. I've played in a band with a guy that played with Jelly Roll Morton. And so this stuff was really close in time almost to us. So the idea of going into the community and looking for things, uh, Herskovitz and his other professor who would go to Haiti and live in a Haitian village and study them. And one of them was a guy who was a musicologist and he was studying uh, the enculturation of Haitian music uh, with friend, you know, that was, and he had a course called Musical, Primitive Music, they never call it that, that today, of course. And I, I took it once for credit and, and audited it once because it was just so fascinating. And he would, uh, he was also a bass player, of course, and that became very important to me too. Not only do you study this, but you take part in it. You don't just go look at it, but you, you become, you live in the village with them. You know, you go and play with them. There's no doubt that Waterman, Dick Waterman, was playing with Haitians, I mean, playing music with them. So for a term, a paper for this class, Remnant of Music, I knew there was a radio program in Chicago, there were lots of them, where a black preacher would start out by praying little by little, his prayer would begin to become, have notes, and it would become a song. And he would finally be singing in this pentatonic blues scale. And I had a friend with a tape, with a recorder. There was no tape recorder. There was no wire recorder. You did it on a wax piece with a needle that was actually cutting the wax. So I set it up with this little radio, and the guy came on on Sunday night, and I recorded him. and wrote a paper on it, which was pretty short, but and turned it in with the record. I mean, so I was learning how to actually do field research with a, so when I came to New York, this is many years later, I saw immediately that there are these really strange stores called botanicas where they sold religious figures that had to do with the Santeria, and I went and visited them and talked to the people about them and got pamphlets describing what they meant. So I began, I found out there was a way of meeting people in these alternative cultures was to look for these botanicas. And at that time, nobody was interested in them outside the people who knew them. There was a guy at Yale, whose name, and I remember having some correspondence with him about this, who had gotten interested in, in this aspect of Puerto Rican culture. And he and I exchanged some letters, but I mean, there was no way we could work with each other or anything like that. But as far as I know, he and I were the only people outside of the community itself that were doing this. And this certainly came from the influence of the Northwestern uh, of Anthropology Department in Herskovitz. So somehow... And that just happened to be an elective that you were taking. Yeah. As was, an art major. Uh, you know, it's, 
that's why I got a BS. Uh, I, I had taken so many courses, Andy, that they had a hard time putting them together to make a you know, major. But so that's why. I, but I was glad of that too. I came to Northwestern to be a, a chemist, and I took this miserable first year course. I should have taken an introductory course and then just left it for something else. But I took a course called semi-micro qualitative analysis. And it was just laboratory work of analyzing drops of stuff in test tubes. I mean, if you dropped your sample on the lab table, it, it already picked up three or four new unknowns. So it was already ruined. People would try to pick it up with their pipettes, but they would come out with 15 unknowns, you know, 15 new chemicals. Anyway, but somehow, and then I kept studying math because I liked its methods, thinking maybe I'll be a mathematician. Well, thank God I decided to become an art major, but I really learned methodology in these science courses that I could apply to even studying things like santeria, you know, how to actually, how to do research. I mean, that's what you really learn in college, is how to go, where to go, to, and this, you know, and getting a master's degree, the whole, most of the job is learning who are the, the experts you have to know about. Mm -hmm. Who is the person that everybody has to know about who wrote the first book on uh, the 14th century Italian Renaissance art? And, and if you have a master's degree, you know who that person is and you've read that book. But in general, in college, you're learning how to do research and where to go to find stuff all the time. And I learned in the anthropology department how I mean, I was already interested in this stuff. I already liked exploring the city, but I realized this could be a method. You know, you could bring this to how you teach. And that's how I actually contacted the guy from Grenada. I just don't know. I don't know, how did I do that? I, somebody must have, somebody would tell you about something. You could meet somebody else who would say, hey, I know an artist in Newark from Grenada. A guy in New York might tell me that, and that might be the way I make the contact. And then he might know somebody else. That's my best explanation mm -hmm. of that. So I can hate you. They'd say, hey, I know a guy in the next village that makes these neat statues, you know. So then you go to the next village, <laughs> which happens to be in that, you know, Newark. <laughs> <laughs> Or Atlanta, and immediately I found the Botanica here. It was called Rondo something or other, and it was on right near well, a couple of streets down. And it, it not only sold the 10 day candles with the saints on them, but it had stuff that was now no longer black it was Hispanic, but now it was Southern black. And they actually could sell you a mojo hand. I mean, you hear about B.B. King and the mojo hand. Well, you could buy a mojo hand. And what it is, it's called foxglove. And it's a little kind of blossom-like thing that when it dries up, it looks like a little tiny shrivel hand. And you can get John the Conqueror root which I don't know what it is, but there are a bunch of little sticks bound up with a string. And you pay $2 and, and you can get edible clay. And you're now in another world of enculturation. Getting, and you hear these things in blues all the time. You know, I got a mojo hand, I'm gonna mess with you, or I got John the, Con John the Conquer root and stuff like that. So even here, I found that stuff, but it, it certainly wasn't as prolific. But later, after I finished it, the bird, I got a job in the neighborhood art center with under CETA money. Jackson and the city managed to get money for an art center, and we had to teach a little bit every day, but otherwise we could do our own art. And there was one that was just black artists except for about three white artists, one of whom was me, in an old school down in Abernathy uh, in Pittsburgh. 
And uh, there I made contact with the black art of Atlanta. I mean, truly, they were it, you know, dancers, musicians, uh, who were some teaching at the AU Center and others who were selling their work on the street. I mean, there were all sorts of people. So we, you know, I met people like Romare Bearden and who would come and give to this center and we had art shows and uh, so that's, I didn't have to go very far anymore because I was now, I was in it. Mm. <clears throat> That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that at all. That idea of being actually a part of that culture. Oh, please get me off. Get another question, please. Okay. Actually, do you mind if we take a, a short break? Yeah, I'm getting, yeah, right. I'm getting a little gaga from, from talking. But it, yeah. So we just came back from a little break, and and we were, you were commenting uh, on how does one meet and get to know anything, and you said that you had some additional thoughts. Yes. I said that we had met through a school that our children was in. Well, that's of course how, that, that's I how you met. met probably Stephanie and Tom. And there was another woman who was quite active named Esther Lefevre, who worked in Cabbage Town and had a ceramic shop, but also as a kind of social outreach to people in the neighborhood. But she was also a musician and found a dent of, she had come from a Mennonite background in Pennsylvania. Oh, this is really interesting. And the reason I knew her is that her husband, Harry Lefebvre, worked at the AU Center. He taught chemistry and we had kids and they had small kids and for some reason we got together and started an alternative kindergarten or play school in a building that was in our apartment complex where a lot of people lived that worked at the AU Center. And where, where is that? It's Beckwith Court. It's right off of Northside Drive, and I can't, the, the streets have been changed, mm -hmm. the names yeah. have been changed, uh, but it's not far from Martin Luther King Boulevard. It's, it, it's now been torn down too, but anyway, uh, faculty members at the AU Center lived along there, all of the Lefevers lived over in Inman Park or somewhere. Uh, it was through these people that we had had our children together in this alternative school and thus met other progressive, shall I say, parents like Skip Marshall, who was the engineer at WRFG, whom we still see too, whose kids were in this school. And as the kids got older, we advanced the school so it became a grade school and other kids came. But these were often the same people that would be, have worked at the Bird or been in these bands. I mean, music also played a connecting role in this in an interesting way. And what was the school called? Well, the very first one, I don't know, but it turned into what was called Peach Tree alternative school and this was a popular thing at that time all over the country for mm -hmm. parents not because they were avoiding say integration or something but that the school system they felt was not serving just the way the students felt in the student rebellion times that the colleges were not serving the needs of the students who were not recognizing them uh, so then it turned into the Atlanta School, which is still operating. At the same time, there would be schools that were real private schools with a slightly elite, like, uh, what's it called? Oh, I've forgotten the name of it. Anyway, you know what I mean. 
Uh, like that, well, Paideia? Yeah, Paideia, that's the one I meant. Paideia was the other alternative school, but definitely not with the kind of people that, although some of our friends had kids in Paideia, yes, we knew those people too. Uh, so there was this network among, that went along with having kids in these schools. And then there was this musical network of people that played music together. Trying to think of any other. No, that's it. That's what I wanted to say. The, the children in school thing. That was, and we had started that already in New York and had what was called the Liberation Nursery. <laughs> the Liberation Nursery. And these kids met in a in Tompkins Square Park, which is sort of the home of you know Allen Ginsberg and the that whole movement. And they met in this little recreation room in the middle of the park with a teacher in a mini skirt, but also an official New York Parks uh, employee shirt with a name tag. It was a funny combination. And she, the rule there was that nobody could enter the room without the kid's permission. That's where everybody was at at that time. So when the plumber came from the city to fix the plumbing and the, the kids voted not to let him in, and he couldn't come in, you know, that was that. There was no, you weren't going to, I mean, that would have been dishonest to say, well, we really do have to let him in. So my children grew up, particularly my oldest daughter, in that sort of atmosphere. And so once a teacher told us, they were in and out of public school too, and then back in an alternative, depending upon what schools were, I, it's hard, I don't know how that all worked. Anyway, she was in a rather good public school in our neighborhood in West End, and the teacher told us that she had raised her hand and said, I know this is not an alternative school, but I'd like to say one word, you know, about my opinion about something. So she prefaced that she knew that she wasn't supposed to talk like that, but she couldn't shut up. Mm -hmm. She had to give her opinion. And then, of course, there was the art scene. These people, <clears throat> and that's, uh, that's a fascinating subject, is the progressive so-called art scenes that have gone from one, like eye drum was a certain point in this, in which everything centered that was going on it was really interesting or new. And prior to that, there had been a place called 800 East. And prior to that, there had been Nexus. And each one sort of taking its turn and fostering what you'd call the Atlanta avant-garde. Now that's it for, you asked me a question. You're talking about the children and schooling um, made me want to go back and ask you uh, about your own youth and uh, as a youth can you describe some influential influential figures or events um, things happening that really made an impression on you Well, there's always teachers there. I mean, there's no doubt that one of the main events of my school years in grade school was that in fourth grade, the fourth grade teacher, a woman, as were every, all teachers in that particular school, was having a really hard time handling the students. And she was grabbing them, and a lot of us are really quite spoiled and not used to being you know, held on the grab by anybody, although I understood why she did it. We were pretty awful. And somebody had the idea that the reason we were behaving so badly was that we were not working up to our true capacity. So they hired a guy. A man suddenly appeared for sixth grade named Mr. Sternig. It even sounded a little stern. Oh, I didn't mean that. And, 
but he, and, and God, is he a good example of what I've been talking about? He immediately <clears throat> started us all on a project of entomolo etymology. Yes, we had to learn the difference between entomology and etymology. And we all made butterfly nets. To and we were all outside running around, it was fall, catching butterflies and mounting them and categorizing them. And it was this physical activity, both a combination of physical and mental activity that kept us all completely busy. There was nobody anymore that was a, a, a problem, a, a discipline problem. And then suddenly the next project was geography. And he had painted a picture of geography with a mountain in the background, snow, a glacier, a river, a lake, a forest, a bay, an ocean, you know, all in the same. And of course, we were all str struck by how clever this was. I mean, we all recognized that this picture and that he had painted it was even more impressive. So we studied geography and then we studied astronomy and all made solar systems out of paper mache with little planets that went around them. And the year came to an end and not, no, not a single person had caused any trouble, and we had all just learned immense amount of stuff. And, and it was so, I see now how he had injected himself into it, like the painting, even, and of course he had to go out and show us how to catch butterflies. He had to whip the net like that, you know, so that the net wound up around the stick. And we all did it together, and he showed us how to make so I think that was a, made a tremendous impression on my, teaching me how to learn things, let's put it that way. Mm. But of course, I was also really interested in physical things and I was very interested in, in the Indians because they seemed so physical to me. I mean. And as a boy, I didn't want to be a cowboy. All my friends, we all wanted to be Indians and run around half naked in the trees and woods of our little town. There were lots of ravines where people couldn't build houses, so there was lots of play space where you could truly fall through the ice and up to your, so that your, the water went into your shoe, you know, and you could really get dirty. And, and then it went down to the lake. The lake was right there and it was just such a great natural play place on the beach and ice in the winter time and it was very adventuresome. So being outside and so going on trips with the Boy Scouts, I mean, <laughs> I have a friend that was just in Chicago a few months ago and said he got up to his friend's house in the suburb and the temperature was 50 degrees below zero. Well, I can't remember it that cold when I lived there, but I do remember going on overnight encampments in, in January in woods with the Boy Scouts, where the, truly if you put your hand in a pump handle, it would freeze. I mean, it was really cold, and we were running through the moonlight in the woods, and that sort of contact with nature in the summertime, I think, meant an enormous amount to me, and uh, I of course belonged to a summer theater when I was in high school. So the minute I went to Northwestern, I, you, even if you weren't, they had a theater school, and that was very important. I mean, a real theater school, was no, and they had a music school, not just music courses, but a whole school, just as they had a school of engineering. So. Uh, you met people who were really good at this. I mean, there were people who were really putting on good plays, and you could be in one act plays even if you weren't a, a student. Uh, so all of that, those opportunities really meant a lot. <coughs> and that's all I can really think of discovering gymnastics discovering that I could never really be a football player. I didn't want to be. 
you know, that it was more fun to tumble. But there was nothing, well, uh, yes, we had a big, fr <laughs> yes, the elephant in the room, the big family problem was, was alcoholism, my father's alcoholism, and possibly my grandmother's too, the, both the two journalists. Uh, my father eventually became a member of AA, and I later in life here in Atlanta had to go to Al-Anon to get over my own. Ronald and I were in a bookstore, the one that's over used to be by the Plaza Theater. She picked up a book and said, here, read this, you'll be interested. And it was called Children of Alcoholism. And I opened the book and I read one thing that a characteristic of children of alcoholism is to have a real big mess somewhere in their life that they're always trying to clean up. I mean, a physical mess. And I put it down and said, well, that's not me. And when I got home, I looked at my studio and thought, oh, yes, it is. Here's the mess. And I went back and bought the book. And of course, as my wife said, suddenly she understood all the things about me she hadn't understood. Uh, growing up in a dysfunctional family, you, of course, have a lot of dysfunctional habits, many of which are very good and help you, makes you, a, I mean, most artists have grown up in this kind of family. And you're great, you're really good at getting good ideas because anything is fair. There are no rules anymore. You know, you can do anything. Anything, no matter how stupid, it's okay because you've seen it done before. Uh, so for a year, I went to Al Anon meetings in the AA uh, headquarters. It's behind Tower Liquors and, <laughs> you know, over on what you call it, Street. Anyway, but it was great because I found out I was not the only person with this problem, everybody else had the same problem. They were supportive, they were all crazy, and I began to see that they dressed in certain strange ways uh, that made some sort of metaphoric sense. And I began to look at my art and my friend's art, and I realized that this is affecting us. We are turning a lot of our experience into metaphors. So I began to do the kind of research that you can only do after you've, you know, gotten a degree in a college and started to write what I now call the iconography of abuse, and it's all the metaphors of the arts, including literature and music, which can be seen as expressions of your early childhood abuse. Some of them are so obvious that one, the, the, the endless still lives of bottles, and, and I mean, now that seems too dumb, but then you pick up, you, I would then go to the biography of this artist. I would, I would say, who would, could write a book called 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which means a person who is essentially living in a liquid environment, and 20,000 leagues meaning that that's the distance as he travels. So if you want to look at the liquid of the oceans as a metaphor for Alcoholism, and you can find this in a lot of country music. If, I, if the ocean were whiskey and I was a duck, I'd dive to the bottom and never come up. So here I go. So what do I do? I read, a, I get a biography of Jules Verne, and the first page says that the first mention of little Jules is that his family, who are all lawyers, had a meeting, a family meeting to discuss finances in their somebody's house in southwestern France. In the morning, the maids discover the whole family drunk on the floor with only baby jewels in his crib, tearing up his lawyer uncle's legal papers. And I just shut the book and say, there you are. There's why anybody could write a book called 20,000 Leagues, or a book called Journey to the Center of the Earth, or any of Jewel Verne's absolutely fantastic books, and then I say, okay, uh, well, I won't go into everybody, but Thomas Edison just begins in an autobiography, or whatever it is, saying, if I hadn't been abused as a child, I would never have been the inventor that I am. And you find out that his mother's favorite punishment was switching his legs, which was popular in the, late, in the 1800s. 
switching is with a you know willow switch or something and then you you say to yourself switch i mean what is his electricity is all about switching now at this point i'll be careful because you can easily say i'm going crazy over it so i will back off a little but the truth is as you read the biographies of these artists you simply are told that their parents were drunks or they were there's a book called Cup of Fury in which one of the few American authors who wasn't an alcoholic describes all modern, starting with, with uh, uh, the guy that wrote, you know, the, to light a match, who wrote about the Arctic all the time, not Joseph Conrad, of course. Anyway, they're all drunks. I mean, everybody. Fitzgerald, you know, one after mm -hmm. another. And Second City in Chicago had a skit where they they just said that so-and-so, 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 Albert Einstein, a great scientist and a great drunk. And the joke was that no matter who you talked about, they turned out to be an alcoholic. And of course, we all knew or thought we knew that Albert Einstein was not an alcoholic. Anyway, I spent a good deal of time working on this subject of the metaphors of abuse and questioning my friends and even at an art show with about 15 or 20 of us who just said, I'm a child of an alcoholic and I'll be in your show. Then I realized that there's more different abuse than alcoholic abuse, that I have friends who, one friend who's the ch child of a minister who was definitely abused. He was turned into a kind of child minister by his father. <clears throat> so we had a show called Anybody, Child of Abuse, period. And suddenly there were 72 artists in this, including the chairman of the art department of Georgia State, Larry Walker, and his daughter, Kara, who's now quite a famous mm -hmm. artist. And I didn't go into that, who was the abuser. but. All of Larry's paintings are pictures of bottles, and I, I, I just won't discuss it anymore. But that was, an, and we had a performance that went along with it that was just wild. There was one young woman that got up on the stage, uh, an artist, I can't remember what she did now, took all, all her clothes and dumped a, a bucket of red paint over her naked body which splashed under the audience. I mean, talk about a dramatic, and it was, sure, you'd say, well, this, she's talking about menstruation, but it was something else. I mean, this was some expression. I did a skit where I put on a skeleton mask and chased another a young woman around the room. I mean, and there were some guys that came to this thing, some leather boys with chains, and somebody said they were sitting in the back of the room crying. Well, they watched this. So this became an enormous part of my life. I never published the book that I wrote called The Iconography of Abuse. I may eventually do it, but uh, it'll never get published because I sent it, sent it to publishers, but they would write back saying, there's nobody that knows enough about this to critique it. Nobody knows about this subject. You pick the subject that nobody has any knowledge of. And I thought, well, can't you just read it and see if you think it makes sense? Mm -hmm. You know, what an idea. Well, that's publishing for you. But anyway, uh, that has become part of my life, too, this analysis of things as they pertain to abuse, particularly early child. And there have been some great books written on this, particularly by a psychiatrist named Alice Miller, a Swiss psychologist or psychiatrist, in which she analyzes the childhood of dictators and how it impressed, how it became, this made them, turned them in, including Ceausescu, Hitler, Stalin, a whole bunch of people. And it's really, and it's people, we now have a person in the White House who's a perfect example of this. He's like a case history of the metaphors. The wall is a great metaphor of the barrier between the abuser and the abused that they're always trying to break through. 
to the point that you realize that all of the great walls of, of history have been more about being metaphors than being useful. The Great Wall of China never kept the Mongols out. It never worked, and no wall has ever really worked. The wall, Hadrian's Wall never worked. Uh, but they were all about something else, about some psychological state of keeping the evil away by mm -hmm. shutting it out. So I have to keep myself under control, you know, a lot. My, a lot of my friends know about this and, and agree with me. And once you start to think about it, you can see the logic in a lot of this stuff. And particularly when you have this evidence from people's biographies and autobiographies that this was the case. Uh, of course, uh, <laughs> who wrote Gulliver's Travels now? Swift. No. Oh well, anyway. Well, take an artist like Hogarth. I mean, his work is just endless examples of, of abuse, alcoholism, and metaphors. Of, and Goya, of course, is another one. If you wonder, anytime you see something that's really on the edge, the fringe, you can figure it's come from this background of some kind. I wouldn't say right offhand that the great speckled bird was a result of this, but it's definitely a possibility. I won't go into any of my friends' mm. lives. Anyway, that was not about my childhood, certainly, but that's something I should tell you. Like, if I didn't mention that, it would be really an untrue picture of my life. Uh, but I can't think of any other. There was a, I had an art professor, George Cohen, who was very influential. He, his idea about art was pretty much, he too had a degree, he was an academic too, so that he did a lot of thinking about art. He had a degree from the University of Chicago in art history, and so that when he switched to teaching studio art, which he was doing when I met him, he had this, really strong background of academic art history. So he had one idea was that art was a way of discovering yourself through art. And I'm not even sure now how popular that idea is, if that's, actually I think it's sort of rare. But anyway, like if you decide through your art that you really wanted to be a shoe salesman, that's what you should then do. I mean, it wasn't the art, it was of no importance. It was really a, a way, a tool, a get at something that was important to your life. I actually was afraid of becoming a shoe salesman. He said if he hadn't become a professor, he would have had to be a shoe salesman. I don't know why that. His, his brother was a fur salesman. I guess that was his idea of something awful that happened to you. But he and his artist wife became sort of models for me and my wife. We, I was, just when I was a graduate assistant, in the same department with him, and they became, the, you know, close friends of ours, and we sort of hoped that we could be like them, you know, artists making our art together. Mm -hmm. And they managed to have a children, a normal life from that point of view, and still be artists which was sort of our goal. Speaking of your, your wife, so you, you said that you had a really bad car accident and then uh, received an insurance settlement that took you to Europe for a couple years? Oh yes, it was amazing. Um, can you talk about that and about meeting your wife? Sure. <clears throat> because of our international interests, actually, we had one summer had some exchange students from Sweden come and lived in the neighborhood. And we had a guy in there. They were all students from the University of Uppsala. And we're just there to see America. But of course, 
And the next year we had some German students who were actually coming as an introduction to study in American universities. And this is your parents? That yes, this was my parents who arranged all of this. I'm, I'm like a junior in college now. I'm about 20 or something. So, of course, the Swedish part is partly because of Swedish and my Swedish connections. And, of course, we got to be friends with all these people and had a good time with them. And when I went to Sweden, which I intended to see, particularly France, I wanted to see where my parents had lived so long. And I wanted to go to Germany to visit the family of the German student. And I wanted to go to Sweden, of course, to see relatives and that student that had lived with us. So I was in France for a while, went to Spain, went to Germany, uh, finally went to Sweden in the fall, stayed for a few days with my cousin, the former mayor of Stockholm. And what year about was This it? was 56. Okay. And uh, like young people, I was just sitting around finally smoking and reading magazines in my cousin's apartment. And his wife said, you know, didn't you come here to see your friend in Uppsala? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you remember you're here not just to sit and do nothing. Uh, so I said, oh yes, that's right. So uh, my cousin drove me to Uppsala. And Sweden is a wild place. I mean, it's, when you get there, you realize you are no longer really in Europe. You have to go through forests and things to get anywhere. And of course, we met a moose in the road that was bigger than our VW bug. I mean, if we'd run into it, it would have been a real mess. Anyway, I met my friend and stayed in a cot in his student room. And right away, they had a party. And I met his other friends and met Ronak's sister and her and her brother and her husband and met another guy who is one of these perpetual students that never leaves the town. He's still there. He's graduated long ago. And he was terribly funny and he and I had a great time. And he said, I want to introduce you to somebody, his former girlfriend. Well, it turned out to be Ronog who had, he said, I want you to meet an American. And she said, she said, not only do I not want to meet any of your friends. I particularly don't want to meet any Americans. But we met and shortly, quickly lost interest in all the other people and started living together. And we, I would be an artist and she would be a writer. And we lived in a student room until we were kicked out. And the, the head of the student housing said that we were, his reason for us having to leave was not that we were not married, but we were wearing the furniture out twice as fast as one person paying the rent would be. And of course, he was quite right. We were wearing it out, I guess. And so we left for Spain, where another Swedish artist we knew had bought uh, a house for $200. And we slowly went through Europe, meeting my friends again in France, many of whom were soldiers. The draft was still going on. And you were either sent to Korea or to the occupation army in Europe, and there were plenty of people in Paris at a local military establishment. So she began to meet Americans, and of course, she's meeting the strangest ones. These are people that have come to be artists and to go up the Congo and, you know, be the ones that change the world. And of course, the guy that goes up to Congo gets malaria and barely comes back alive. And one says he guess he has to go back to his father's Thai store in Miami Beach. You know, he's not the writer he thought he would be. And meeting their French girlfriends. And you know, this is the new uh, lost generation. Mm -hmm. Finally, we get to Spain and and say, play the guitar and play flamenco, we have to go to Granada. And, you know, that was another time. Anyway, if we finally go to Mallorca, which is where the guy's house is, and it is, it's a $200 house. It isn't worth a damn. It doesn't have any glass windows, there's no running water. And we live there with our friend who is also drinking too much. His wife is having an affair with some German on another 
island of Ibiza. I mean, this is <laughs> where the Mallorca hadn't been discovered by Americans yet, but it had been discovered by Germans and Swedes. And it's it's the it's the land where Chopin and George Sand lived for a year. And she wrote a book called Winter in Mallorca, which they're selling in bookstores in Mallorca as if it's a tourist book. But they apparently haven't read it in French, and Rona reads it, and I do too. And there's this incredible condemnation of this island and all the idiots that live there and how what fools the Mallorquins are. And there's half, they're smilingly selling it. In the end, she says she blames Mallorca on Chopin's death. It's where he got tuberculosis or something from the poor, you know, houses and poor housing. And so she blames it directly on Mallorca. So here we are in Mallorca, and they don't even speak Spanish, it turns out. They're speaking Catalan. Uh, but we are, we carry on as artists and meet the, meet the foreign community and meet people we never would have met, like one big influence on a lot of us in the 50s were Swedish movies, Ingmar Bergman and others. And the first movie I saw that really struck me as a movie that had to do with my own life and feelings was called Torment, about a, a high school student in Stockholm who falls in love with a girl in the cigarette store, but she is having an affair with his math teacher. <laughs> I mean, and it's not the experience I ever had, but it it suddenly touched, you know, my own experience as a kid, as a youth. And it turned out that the director of the movie's name was Alf Furberg, which is my name in Swedish. Seberg is the, it's a Swedish word for. Fru I mean sea or lake. So everybody you see was a name like Sea Crest or Sea Lund or something is probably was Fru before. Anyway, uh, one day we're it's spring now and a friend of mine has come from just getting his master's degree at Harvard. He flew flies from Boston <laughs> directly to Mallorca. I mean talk about uh, but we have a certain culture there, and he is having a shave in the local barber shop because that's the way everybody did. Nobody had shaved themselves. And a guy comes to our house that we know, a Swedish actor who was retired there, who was quite famous, but not to me. I mean, I, he's just a guy. And he's with another man. He says, here is Alf Shrewberry I want you to meet. <laughs> Here's the director of the movie. And I say, you've got to meet my friend Marshall, also of Swedish descent. His name is Matson, But he's down at the barber. He's being shaved. Can you come down with this? So we all go down to my friend. And here's Marshall with his, you know, lather over his face. And I say, Marshall, here's Alf Shrewberry, the director of Torment. And Marshall can only go, rah, rah, and hold out his hand like this. And then Shrewberry has to leave. He's going somewhere else. And that would happen in Mallorca. We would meet suddenly people like that, you know, the world, uh, people that were really, in, then it turned out that the writer of the movie was this unknown young man named Ingmar Bergman had written the movie. And when you go to Stockholm, you can go and see the school where the character in the movie is supposed to have gone, the Sudra Latin. So suddenly you're face to face with these things that have been. And in Sweden, I, a guy came to give a talk, and it was Richard Wright, came to give a talk to some Swedish students. And I remember, I mean, I'd read his books, I knew who he was, and I went up to him and did the usual foolish thing. I said, you know, I, I'm really, I'm, I'm, like a great fan of black culture. I played the banjo, I played the sax, I played jazz. But I said, you know, it's like it's sort of not my fault, slavery, and, and you know, I don't feel responsible. Now, this has turned out to be such a cliche of white people to say that, but he was so nice to me. You know, he was, he was really 
pleasant and didn't say, by you idiot, you know, that's what they all say. <clears throat> so I think, and then of course Ingmar Bergman came to give a speech in Uppsala, and I didn't know Swedish, and I sat in the front row listening to him and fell asleep in the front row and within 15 feet of this guy, and whom I'm trying to understand. And that's, I don't know what sort of a memory that is, but actually Ingmar Bergman isn't very good at giving speeches. It was not just my fault. He's a great director, but he is pretty boring when he talks about, like many artists, about his art. Anyway, so Ronak and I stayed for a year in Mallorca, wait, not way too long, but both of us got hepatitis, I, and, and the care in Franco, Spain was not so good, and we decided to get married, but we're told by the American Embassy in Madrid that not only did the Spaniards have a hard time getting married, even when they were citizens, but Protestant foreigners, it was going to be impossible, and you should go to a country where there's religious freedom and get married. And they said the nearest place is Morocco. Well, we hadn't thought of Morocco as the, you know, this, but it's true. Morocco wasn't, they said, there are many, lots of missionaries there who don't really go out anymore missionizing, but they can marry you right away. You know, they spend most of their time going to tea parties in, in Tangiers. So we went there and by God, and somebody had warned us, they said, don't go in the Kasbah. Well, of course, we ended up in a hotel in the Kasbah. That's always where we do. And, but it was OK, because the American consulate was also in the Kasbah because of American involvement fighting the Barbary pirates in, the, in 1815 or whatever it was. So this was the first American consulate in Africa. It was the one we got married in by a Baptist minister. Who, and they, we went there and they said, do you want to be married today? And I got cold feet and said, no, no, I'm not ready. I don't know what I thought it was going to happen. I said, I want to be married tomorrow. So we came back the next day and Ron and I had help from a girl in the hotel ironing her blouse. We had no fancy clothes. And it was obvious that the girl with the iron was a prostitute. We had ended up in a hotel that was... Mostly there were needles in the wastebasket and stuff like that. But that was what you did in those days. All of us, nobody wanted a church wedding. We all wanted to marry in some strange way. I mean, if you get married at all. I had friends in Sweden that never got married. They became grandparents and they still weren't married because that wasn't the thing to do. Later in life, Ronak said, Oh, we could have had a marriage with all the family, including the Americans, in Sweden in a medieval church, and that's true. In, in Uppsala, you know, a thousand-year-old church, and, well, not a thousand years old, but pretty old. But it was too late, and you know, we could no longer, couldn't go back and do that. So we did miss out on the kind of weddings that they're now having, you know, where you hire some old plantation house in Roswell, and, you know, you fly your friends in from uh, wherever it is, you know, Baltimore. And you do that. Anyway, we went back to Sweden and I went into a hospital. I had a relapse and was treated in the children's ward because that's the only ward that, would, that was the infectious disease ward. So all my fellow patients. A relapse of hepatitis or something from your car accident? No, or? this was a relapse of hepatitis which is an infectious disease, but nobody else had it but me. All the children had things like chicken pox and stuff. They would come in, or just the flu, they'd come in crying one day, and two days later they were laughing and going. I was a little jealous. I was never, Rona would come and visit me, and she was also still so tired from this disease. She'd just lie in my bed and cry. <laughs> that was a great visit. But so it took us about a year. Finally, we were back in the United States, and and what you know, year is that? Because you left in to go 56, there in '56. You now it's '59. Wow. We're back in the United States, and we're well, and we go out to some local roadhouse for our first beer of the year with some friends, and then my friend George Cohen 
tells me that there's an opening as a teaching assistant in the art department. Now this, I look back on this, and this is truly a miracle when that this happened, because within a month of coming back, I now have a job as a teaching assistant getting a master's degree at Northwestern. And that brings us up to singing in the coffee house, eventually working at the museum, leaving for New York, teaching, adopting two interracial children, working at Rutgers, moving to Atlanta, adopting a third interracial child, uh, working at Clark, working at the Neighborhood Arts Center, working at the Great Speckled Bird, uh, becoming an acrobat. <laughs> Yeah, that's a lot of living. Yeah, living well, there. I mean, I'm 88, so I mean, I've had a lot of time to do stuff. But we have not avoided, Nonag's idea of being a writer, she was always annoyed with these writers that... And got, was she a novelist? Yes, she wrote seven novels in Swedish. One is translated into English, but not published. I'm going to do it. It's very good about life in New York in the 60s. <clears throat> But her, she was always annoyed with these women, she had particular favorites, who got teaching jobs and then just wrote about sex on the campus. And she said, you got to get out into the world to really, you know, like, live on the Lower East Side and write about, or even writing about Atlanta during those days was more adventuresome. It was not, you know, the faculty love affairs, which she, uh, she was a good friend of Rosemary Daniel, I don't know if you know who she is. She's a Georgia poet who's quite good. And spent a year on an oil rig <laughs> working just to see what it was like, you know, and write about life on an oil rig. Rosemary so, did that? Yes. <laughs> so that was in Ronak style too. But by this time we couldn't she couldn't go on an oil rig. We just had to, you know, make do with our children. And what did your families think when you guys paired up and then they learned, maybe by telegram, <laughs> oh, that you had gotten married in Morocco? Of course, Ron always written a book about that. She <laughs> writes, <laughs> well, they had to swallow it. I mean, it's their fault. They, they did this. I mean, they are the ones that always extolled foreign travel and foreign art and... and the exciting life, you know, of the artists and journalists, and so they couldn't say much about it. And uh, when they got to know Ronald, of course, they got along fine. But my mother had some moments that were, uh, as a you know person with a degree from the University of Chicago, I felt were really below her when she. Uh, really got upset that I was somehow being taken away from her by my wife, which of course is what happens. I, I can't go into the details of that. It's, you know, but it was sort of, she behaved in a human way a little, but in a little bit dysfunctional. Yeah, there's been some dysfunction in the family, the way there is moments in which nobody spoke to each other. I mean, we didn't speak with my, to my parents. But later, after my father had died and we had the kids in Atlanta, we went summer after summer to Chicago and just had a wonderful time drinking martinis with my mother while our kids went to the beach and swam in Lake Michigan. So that all turned out very well. No, I, my mother was proud of it, actually, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so were her friends, her North Shore Republican friends, I think were terribly eager to be part of our life as an interracial family. I think many people thought that was a good thing and they wanted to help as much as possible. One of my daughters became a sort of part consular in this little Republican, almost all white town, taking little kids to the beach every day. And that's something interesting too. Practically all the towns in the North Shores, it's called, were pretty much segregated. Some even had 
covenants against Jews living in them, or, but not the town I was in. For some reason, it had the largest population of Jewish people of any of the North Shore towns, and it had a synagogue, which none of the other small suburb, suburbs, and they're all in a row. Like and this a, is Glencoe? Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, the first girl I'm really in love with in high school is Jewish. And all my friends, half of them at least, are Jewish. I mean, if people ask me, what do you think of Jews? I say, well, what do I think of people? You know, I mean, I don't know how to separate them. Uh, and there was this very small black community that went back to before the Civil War. I mean, a couple of blocks of African-American families. There was a little Italian section where it was claimed that during Prohibition there was a guy that went around with a big overcoat and a bottle of Chianti, and he would sell you Chianti by the glass, by opening his, and he had the glass, you know, you'd drink it on the sidewalk where you met him. Uh, and then Evanston, where I'd also lived, and we lived together when I was in school, also had a very old black population and black churches that went back uh, to some time like the Civil War. So uh, I grew up in towns, two different towns, that were already different from other suburban towns in that they had, they were diverse, they did have I did meet people of this of these backgrounds. So moving into that society was not didn't seem strange much at all. And what was your family's sort of perspective on race and what is going racial politics? Well, underneath everything, like everybody that there was some racism even in my parents, I believe. I hate to say it, but just a tiny bit. But it was never applied to my children or anything. It was sort of generalized stuff. I mean, I never heard either of them say a word. It was nothing, it's hard to explain. I'd have to, it's not worth telling the story, but you can't escape it to be have to be of some they had a lot of records and I that really had a big influence on me. Seventy eight records and many of them were what now is recognized as coon songs. They were white performers singing as if they were black people and they were really good. And this whole idea of how you shouldn't imitate that there's something strange about that because all jazz musicians are imitating black, all white jazz musicians are imitating black jazz musicians. That's how you learn. It's like, you know, you learn, you play Stravinsky if you want to be a, a classical pianist. So if you want to play jazz, you've got to learn to play like Nat King Cole or somebody like that. And that's not considered racist, but I can see how it's a little bit similar to, I mean, putting on blackface and singing as if, you know, and I can sing those songs. Uh, and I'll admit that blackface is a little grotesque and that's, that's, I, but anyway, I learned so much, but among those songs were, were, were music by real black musicians and comedians like Bert, Bert, oh, what's his name? Burt Reynolds, not Burt Lahr. Um, anyway, he's a famous black comedian from the teens and, and black musician. So I, I heard that too without really knowing what I was doing, but it was definitely, it wasn't racist, it was just that's what people, it was the jazz of the 20s and they had a typical collection of that kind of music and that, I wanted to play like that. I mean, that was so good. That was so exciting to do that. And that led me and my wife to find, to meet blues musicians later in the 60s 
she said as we sat in our graduate student housing, which is this terrible old house, more than graduate student housing. Anyway, <clears throat> she said, well, where are these blues musicians you talk about? So we just set off in Chicago to find them. And the way, to, this is again a question of knowing where to go. We went to a record store that specialized in blues, run by a white guy. And he said, yeah, tomorrow night there'll be a rent party at such and such a place where Howlin' Wolf and Willie Dixon will be playing. And we went there and there they were. And we met J.B. Lenore and Willie Dixon and Howlin' Wolf and Buddy Guy and got to know these people, little brother Montgomery. And Ronald wrote a book <laughs> about them. Uh, uh, and we became their friends. And made a movie of them, which we tried to put on Swedish television, but they, for some reason, Swedes can be really s stupid and, um, what is it, what's the word I want? Uh, well, anyway, and they didn't use it, so it stayed on a shelf in our house here in Atlanta for 40 years, and. Finally, somebody calls me up and says, <clears throat> we're calling you, there's a very important movie director that has heard that you have film, vintage archival film footage of J.B. Lenore, who had died a year after we'd made the movie. So I said, you're kidding me. And people are always calling me up and want to see this movie and nothing ever comes of it. You're just a phony. I really let them have it over the phone. They said, this woman got really appalled. She got really sad and said, no, no, it's true. It's a real producer, a real director. I said, well, why can't you tell me his name? Oh, I can't do that. Well, to make the story short, it was Vim Vendors is going to make a movie in this blues series, which is run by Vincent Scorsese. And each director gets to choose some blues musicians he wants to feature. And Vim some reason picks two, three blues musicians, all of whom are dead. So he's already got a terrible problem, but he finds that we have this, he, he has done research. He calls Alligator Records in Chicago, and they just happen to have a guy working there that knows us and has helped us make the movie. So again, finally it ends up, Vim Vendors comes to Atlanta, interviews us. We can't be paid because they don't pay in public television for being interviewed, but I sell them eight minutes of the archival footage for $24,000, $50 a second. And I didn't make that up. I call a friend here, one of these same people in our network, George King, you may know, who's a movie maker, and I say, George, what do you charge a second? And he just says $50. Later I said, George, you really, God, it was great that you knew. And he said, I didn't know. He said, I just said that. I didn't know I knew it was $50. So I give part of the money, of course, to J.B.'s widow. And then Ronald and I, you know, that's the story of the artist finance. The next year comes, but there's no $24,000 next year. There's no movie to sell next year. It's like the grants. Well, what happened to the grant? Why don't we have it this year? But anyway, <clears throat> that certainly, uh, I mean, we too, I mean, that was like a continuation of being an anthropologist, except, and we're doing it too. I'm in the movie playing with JB. I'm sitting there with my guitar from Granada, playing, you know, my name is JB Lenore, and it's the way my song goes, and, uh, it's like a continuation of this same world of becoming part of the... Because I too feel strange. I don't like to sing... I know all of Lead Belly's songs. I can sing them all, but I think I'm not him. Am I, am I trying to... Am I stealing his culture? I don't think so, because I think he'd be happy. I've met Lead Belly. I played his guitar once after a concert in Chicago. and. I don't think he'd be, I think he'd be happy to find, like I would, if I, just, you know, that my art was being furthered by other people, even though there's, 
like we saw, there were so many white musicians in Chicago that were, of course, fascinated by the black music of these guys because it's so good. And I can't, there was no point in naming them now, but some of them were already dead. They're young men we saw that came to see these. What am I talking about now, Andy? Fascinating tales of of Chicago and your young life and race relations and perspectives on interracial friendships, collaborations. Yeah, it was. How does all this fit in with with what's going on in the larger? political and social world around race? Because this is the early 60s? Uh, it's the late 60s. Late 60s now? Yeah, like, it's like the 60s, the crazy 60s didn't really start until like 65. It was like halfway through. We were still wearing suits and but the, there were the beatniks that now arrived, but they were still a rare commodity. Allen Ginsberg, and of course we saw Allen Ginsberg not often, but on the Lower East Side. But he'd stopped writing poetry and was just dropping acid, <laughs> as far as I could see. Our friends that we knew that were in that scene was Ed Sanders and the Fugs, that we knew pretty well, who were banned from the radio. You couldn't play their records on the radio, but their show every night on the Lower East Side, people were coming in from the suburbs and busloads, and it was the time of the naked show of, of Jesus Christ Superstar and, and Hair and, and uh, Calcutta and people naked on stage. And I mean, that's when everything was, that was like 65. To 70. And in 70, the mob started to move in, and the first hippie was killed over dope. And then you realize that things are getting going to get bad now. And the Lower East Side poets like Ted Berrigan and others moved to Bolinas, California. Where they, I don't know what they did there. We went to Bolinas too, but that was also crazy. Uh, just as on a visit, but in 70 everything, pollution became terrible in New York, and that's when I decided, we decided we should go to Atlanta, where our friend from Morehouse had come from. He said, they need you in Atlanta at Morehouse. He said, teach art at Morehouse. So this friend that you got a job yes, at, this, at uh, Rutgers, yeah, Tom he, he's the person that told you. So without finding out, Andy, if they even Turned out they don't have an art department at Morehouse, but we didn't care. We packed our stuff and came and stayed in Pascal's motel for a week. And I left my resume, and then we just went on to Miami because there was no job here, and might as well have some fun. So all my kids, and two, we had two kids then, little kids and wife, went swimming. I sat in this terrible Miami motel room writing, sending resumes places, and suddenly by some miracle got an answer from Clark that they did need an instructor in humanities for a program that was strangely enough to introduce African and Afro-American culture to historically black colleges. They had found that places like Morehouse and Spelman and Bennett and all these places all over were still really teaching white culture to their black students. So this government program, we went every year to a summer workshops where African writers would talk to us and we'd see African movies and, and talk about African. And most of us in the program were black, but many of us weren't. It was pretty diverse. So. It was absolutely up my alley because it's exactly what I've been doing already at Rutgers, trying to introduce this 
well, I guess I did at Rutgers. So it was a really interesting program, but when it ended, uh, it was going to move on and I could move with it to Baltimore. I hadn't heard anything good about Baltimore. And by this time, our kids were now in, in these schools and had friends here, and we had friends. And so we just stayed with it here, bought a house in West End, and stayed here and did what we had to do here. And what was the dis I have a lot of questions about many of these things. But what was the decision, um, or how did the decision come about to adopt children? Because we couldn't have them naturally. That's an easy answer. We had always intended, without sort of wordlessly, that we would. My wife had came from a big family, a big family, and so uh, <clears throat> we tried various things and, you know, different hormone stuff, and there were some bizarre moments. This. <laughs> I really won't repeat them on camera, but one, one doctor who was helping us to get fertile was the very doctor that had been at my birth from the Evanston Hospital when we were living in that. That was a little bizarre to have him know, you know. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, we realized that we weren't going to have a, nat a child by a lot of natural child. So the obvious thing was there were so many children that needed to be adopted that we would do that. And of course, the ones that had the hardest time were interracial children. So we told a New York adoption worker that that's what we wanted to do. And at that time, I didn't have a job. And she said, how are you going to support this child? And I said really, you know, sort of thoughtlessly, I'll get a job. And they did. Within a couple of months, I was teaching at Rutgers, but Andy, I looked back on that and I thought, how did they do that? What a, a, how, I just happened to have a friend who was teaching at Rutgers, too, another artist in New York, who knew it was like the job in Chicago. How did just happen to be there when this job was open? And I looked back and I thought, oh my God, what fantastic luck. And well, and that the social worker Adoption yeah, well, she agent or whatever. It. She she said okay. Yeah, that, that I don't think that that would happen these days. I think that they want probably like fifteen years of tax returns. And yes, yes. <laughs> character oh, yes. witnesses and. But oh yes, now it would be, and even ado adopting interracial children. I mean, it's all become problematic, and we said we would not even, but we we would certainly take an American Indian child. And that's what we got. Our first daughter was actually not a black American, but her father was a Sudanese exchange student and her mother a Mohawk Indian, uh, which has been a problem for her all her life because she truly doesn't fit into the what would be called black society of Atlanta. Uh, our next child was a mixed race, a boy, but he was just of the usual American, you know. He was definitely partly Caucasian because Curtis as a young man, or not as a boy, as a kid, like three, had a, suddenly in the midst of his rather brown but kinky hair, had a blonde hair that was perfectly straight and stood up like a flame out of the middle of his head. It was really bizarre. But anyway, our third child was also a, an interracial child that we adopted here in Atlanta. But that was the reason. So we decided to do the best we could. And of course, found other people in, in Atlanta that had adopted children, also of other races, too. And of course, there are more and more people not even adopted, just who are of mixed race. And a lot of people in the art community that are part Japanese, part Chinese, part Filipino, part lots of things. And we know them all. <laughs> and they're all our friends. Was Hugo Black and his wife, were they in Atlanta? Oh, we know them not well, but that's another story. But 
I don't want to get off into gossip. And I don't know how much, it isn't that I know stuff that I shouldn't tell, it's just that I know, like Hugo Black, of course, had a lot of kids on his farm who were foster kids. And we knew that. And a woman here who wanted children, who she has a bookstore, I'll just say that, and was a friend of Ronog's because Ronog's a writer and we knew this woman. And Ronog said, I will help you find a child. And she did. She went to the, called up the blacks and found there was a child. <clears throat> and this woman adopted that kid who is still around and has a name, of course. So that's how we know the blacks, mm -hmm. just because of that, because of uh, we may know them through the Lefevers because Esther and Harry Lefevre had a, their own daughters, but also adopted a boy named Dimitri, who is, may still be around too. And all these people, all these kids all went to school together. These were in the people who were in this uh, Peachtree peach Alternative School. Yeah, I just asked with. No, I've heard, sto heard radio know, stories. You know, what the, you know who to ask about. That was right on. You really did. It just turned out that the blacks have sold their farm in the last week or something. Oh, really? I mean, I haven't talked to them. I never knew them very well. I think Ronald knew them better mm -hmm. than I did. So when you come to Atlanta, um, you had led a pretty cosmopolitan life. You had been in Chicago, but spent years abroad, had been living in New York, or familiar with New Jersey. What are your impressions of Atlanta when you arrive here? <clears throat> well, just physically, to arrive, that it was it's so incredibly green. I mean, coming from New York, anything's going to be green. But it still impresses me. When I look at it from my dentist's office window, I think, my God, this is the greenest. And Chicago is pretty green, but nothing like Atlanta. It's just so green everywhere. Looking across the city to Stone Mountain, it's quite amazing. Uh, we came here partly because we, this was going to be a town run by African Americans. And we had children who were going to be African American children. And we wanted them to be in a town where the politics were in the hands of black people. Hardly know what word to use. Uh, and it happened. It happened within a year. Andrew Young was already a representative, and Maynard was elected mayor. And all of it was happening at the AU Center. That was the center of political, center of black politics. I mean, we all knew who Du Bois was. And, <clears throat> And we, as I said, we could march in parades with Jose Williams, or Hosey as he was always called, and Joe Boone, and Ralph Abernathy, and uh, Julian Bond, I'm just trying to name. When I was at the Neighborhood Arts Center, the chairman of the, <clears throat> of the board or something was Shirley Franklin. And at a board meeting, she said to all of us, she said, I need a babysitter. Does anybody, can anybody help me? And I said, yes. My daughter, Selena. So my daughter, Selena, became the Franklin's babysitter. And the Young's, uh, Andrew Young's brother's, whatever his name is, his babysitter. And so David, David Franklin would drive up to our modest house in West End in his some super car and my 13 year old daughter would go out and get in and he would drive them off to Tuckawana Drive where she would sit and watch TV with the kids and <clears throat> of course David was the lawyer for what's his name who you know uh, the comedian you know blew himself up and David was a little bit on the crooked side, and 
Sulina said, she said, I think they're taking heroin at some of these places. She said, I think that the youngs, you know, there are people that are in, that of course, there has been some uh, accusations that that has happened. Shirley Franklin, which I know pretty well, is certainly not, as, and she, of course, I think, got divorced, and she from David, I can't remember, but she certainly was not part of anything like that. But the point these is... These people were living, living the jet, in the met, jet set. These are the people you could meet if you, in Atlanta at that time. Of course, everything turned a little sour when, what's his name, the next mayor, you know, who's now in jail, or what's his name, oh well. Nader had a second, a second tour as mayor in which he did not do such good things because Frank, he, he's the one that started all the art programs, but, and because we made a fuss, artists got together and every time we see Maynard at a, any election thing, we'd just say to him, what are you going to do for the arts? And he would say, oh, I'm going to see that, and he did. He started the Neighborhood Arts Center, he started the Bureau of Cultural Affairs, but the, his next uh, regime, his next tour, whatever, what's term. It? Term, yeah, term. Actually, he didn't do so much because federal money had run out. I mean, at one point, Seattle and Atlanta were, equal, were the two cities giving the most money to the arts of any American cities. But in a few years, it was only Seattle that was doing it in America. We still have the view of cultural affairs. We still have public art. It's staggered along, but uh, it's not the way it was in the first years. But it was a struggle with the white artists. There were a lot of there was a whole white art white art arts community that started mural projects here, and all, all the muralists were white. And I took it upon myself to confront these ladies who now are as old as I, and I don't dare bring up this stuff with them. You know to think you were the woman who, you know, that attacked me because I criticized you for only having white artists do the murals in downtown Atlanta. Now we're so old, we have to get along. That's happened to a lot of people. And the, there's warning to you, you know, don't, it's all gonna smooth out eventually. But it was an exciting place to be. I mean, it, it was a struggle going on, a cultural struggle, and, and it was difficult. And finally, the money began to dry up. And the bird was became, of course, uh, what's the word? Uh, not a dinosaur. That's not the word I want. But became irrelevant. It no longer, you know, was functioning. It, it couldn't deal with a new, really black administration. It, it, it probably would have had to die anyway, as people did. I mean, John Jacobs is dead. Uh, <clears throat> Now I'm in pure speculation. I don't know. What am I? I'm not talking about anything useful now. <laughs> Please help me out of this. <laughs> Tell me more about Atlanta when you first arrive and what you're... Okay. You, you said that you were impressed with how green it was. Yeah, keep, yeah, please keep me on the track. Yes, there were, there were interesting aspects of it. One was that they had not... They had a... They had a highway system, but it wasn't quite finished. So there were some bizarre places. There was a place south of the old state. Oh, the, we've seen every the stadiums that have come and gone here, and that is such a peculiar thing in Atlanta. But anyway, south of the stadium on the way to the airport, uh, <clears throat> there was a place where a street came out and butted up directly against the expressway. I mean, there was just a stop sign and a sign that said one way. You, you wouldn't have wanted to turn the other way. There was a place that had two little tiny ramps, but only a stop sign. I mean, it was nothing like you merge with the traffic. And there were two of those places 
down there within a block of each other where you could drive by accident directly on the, that was a strange thing. And the airport was not done. There was an airport, but it was not the modern one. So we saw that put in during the time we were here. And the whole expressway system changed. There are still leftovers of the old expressway, like when you try to turn off, like at Claremont, there's a strange place where you go down in a lower, I don't know, maybe it isn't Claremont, but it's somewhere up there, where you're in an expressway section that's below the other. You can look up mm -hmm. at it. That lower place was the original expressway and stuff like that. Uh, trying the revival of Auburn Avenue. What do you, let's go back to where you were. I, I, I don't want to just go through any old thing. Ask your question again. I, I just did sort of your initial impressions of Atlanta as a city and also as a, as a place in the South and what, what your impressions of. I'll try to. Well, what, what is this it's thing? It's still the way it is. Atlanta is so different from anything around it. I mean, Rona got a job, and this is quite remarkable for a person who did, this isn't English is not her mother tongue, but teaching poetry for the Georgia Council for the Arts, which meant going to schools and doing residencies in rural schools and other towns, and she went all over. Georgia and I would often visit her on weekends in places like Thomaston or Tunnel Hill. That was her first job. Tunnel Hill. That is such a tiny place and it's so rural. And it is so different from Atlanta and people are terribly conservative. But she managed to get along with them and found out that the ladies in the church group in Tunnel Hill would put on three or four pairs of socks and go to the local prison and in the prison take them off and give them to the girls who were in prison there. See, because it was illegal for them to wear socks. <laughs> and this really changed your opinion of rural Georgia. So we got lots of very good impressions of Georgia other than the ones you get sort of from at a distance. Uh, but still, Atlanta is a very different place. People don't have southern accents. Often people grow up here without southern accents. Well, they have a different, there are lots more Democrats, of course. Uh, but it, it was a, a respite after New York. I mean, it was a good place, seemingly, to have a family and, and work and live. It may not be now anymore. I can't say that, uh, but so the impression of it, and it was full. I mean, we really met interesting people right away and decided it was a place worth living and that we could, and it has been. Ronald and I, our own art, we have found great support for it and other people that wanted to do things with us. And right now it's not as easy as it was then, actually. I don't know. Mm. It's not getting easier. And, but that may be partly just because of the general political uh, atmosphere in the whole country. I don't know. And for me, it was quite a way startling because I was a really, was a Yankee, being my two great grandfathers that fought in the Union Army, one who was killed by the sesh, as they called them, in Perryville, Kentucky. One ancestor who was shot by a cousin. He just came back to the South to visit a Southern cousin because many of them had come from the South years before and was shot in an argument by the Southern cousin. So I had a pretty poor picture of the South. I mean, it was not full of nice people, including my own, you know, people that may have been distant relations. So I've realized now I've lived here longer than any place in my life. And I have become an Atlantan. Yeah. It happens to us. Yes, and there are lots of people like me, like the Mennonites and the whoever. But I have Southern friends who have lived here all their life, 
I mean, I have a friend in Alabama and our great-grandfathers may have faced each other at the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain. But we just think it's sort of funny, it's another artist. Um, although recently he's gotten excited about the destruction of Confederate monuments, I mean, upset by it. And I'm not sure if he isn't reverting to some sort of, you know, whatever. I haven't seen him recently. He and the guy from Morehouse grew up in the same town, Scottsboro, Alabama. They're at the same age and never knew each other. He went to a black school and Clyde went to a white school, and they only met years later in New York. And that's sort of Southern, you know, how can that happen? Mm. I have another friend that grew up in Vitalia with a black nanny, you know, who you know, came every day to work in the house and was, became the sort of confidant of, the, of his mother. And this became the mother's friend, you know, this black woman who had to go back every night to her own you know, shotgun house in Vidalia. And this guy now lives in, the, in Brandon Tower, this elder, you know, mm. home in East Atlanta, and where there are only two other white people. And, and <laughs> it's, it's bizarre. And, I mean, I'm never quite used to the South. But the North wasn't better, and you know, underneath it was as racist, and and um, as anything. So I like Atlanta. I mean, I guess I have to say that, and that it, it's it's an interesting place. I mean, it's I don't know what I think of the new movie industry because I've actually come back to find it in my own street. You know, and, the, and given the cars told that there may be gunshots tomorrow, not to worry. Mm. So I'm sitting at my computer and there, bang, bang, across the street, will go the gunshots. And then Andy, for some reason, I just hear a voice shout later, bang, bang. Then I have to go out and I say, if you run out of ammunition, you know, you're just having to say bang, bang in the street. <laughs> But they're here with their cables and their cables lying in the street and vans with generators going. My daughter now works for people that set up these things. Mm -hmm. They wanted to use my house as a place where a little girl is told not to go by her mother but goes anyway, you know, like the local witch's house. So I asked the woman to come in to look at it and she looks at it and because it's filled with paintings on the wall and many naked people, they decide that my house is not just too much for their little girl who should not go in my house. Even the actress shouldn't come, so I never hear from them again. <clears throat> so that's my relation with the movie business. Yes, I have another reputation I guess I'll have to tell you about. And that is, I've been with a group of people that have appeared in Freedom Park many years ago, every year for a while, completely naked. Because as an artist, I mean, we had to study the, the human figure all the time. I had to teach classes and called, you know, life drawing, it's called. And it struck me, also being of Swedish descent, the Swedes are quite casual about nudity, and my father was and I sort of inherited that and certainly my wife was too. Nobody in her family even owned a bathing suit. In the summertime you just you know, the Swedes the Swedes they were never really Christianized. They they still believe they're part of the natural world and they're no better or worse than the moose that they're all mm -hmm. over. So in the summer, they go to their summer place and take all their clothes off, and that's the way it is. So Rolick and I wanted to do this, but of course we can't really do it anywhere in Atlanta. So we decided we'd, we'd have a group called the, Naked, the Atlanta Naked People. So 
for about four years in a row, we had a Sunday every in the summer when we went to Freedom Park and early in the morning, like eight o'clock, took our clothes off and spent about two hours just running around naked and it was really amazing. And the first year we did it, people of course heard about it, wasn't it? And somebody turned out said they were having a, an orange, uh, what is it called? Uh, that drink, an orange blossom, is that what it's called? With vodka and Anyway, they were having a cocktail party on their front porch with us as the entertainment <laughs> on summer Sunday. Well, somebody also went to the police, some reporter from the AJC. They never wrote about it, but they went, yes, they did. They wrote about it, they went to the police and said, do you know about this? And the police said that they didn't do anything about this sort of thing unless everybody was drunk. Well, we weren't <laughs> drunk, that was interesting. So we were never bothered year after year. We hoped it would become a thing like the marathon, but it never did, it never. And what years was this taking place? I can't remember now, it was like 2002 to five or something, I think. I have to go back and look at my, now it's been lots of people who are well known in the arts community were in this group, of course. Because about how many people would participate? Well, it got to be less and less, unfortunately, but the first time was about 25 or 30 of us, so it was a good group. And it was completely improv, and it was pretty funny. And uh, one year there was a sculpture show in the park, outdoor sculpture, which we all then climbed on. So I have these great pictures of naked people upside down on modern art. and. Uh, Ronig and I had a poetry act in which we read poetry. She read her poetry, but we did acrobatics. And she learned to do this when she was 65, and she was really good at it. And we often did this naked. And we would simply go somewhere, like to a woman's festival, like Astro Fest, and get up and do a poem, and then just simply take our clothes off on stage and do two more. Really matter of fact, and of course we're now in our 60s. We're not. This obviously isn't. We're not trying to tempt anybody, and uh, and we got away with this, and we did this quite a, not a lot in Atlanta, but a lot really. Atlanta. We were more. We felt safer in Atlanta doing this. We did it once in the German Art Gallery in Berlin. We did it once in Sweden, and. But we mostly did it, strangely enough, in Atlanta. It was here that we got the most support for doing the most outrageous things, strangely enough. And once we thought we'd just move to Sweden where things would be better, and there would be more support for the arts. But after a year, we found out that it was sort of boring that life in America and Atlanta... You actually did relocate to Sweden? No, we just stayed no. for a winter. And it was the coldest winter since 1935. And so when spring came, we said, back to America, you know. We're the, the, that's it. We visited Sweden a lot, that we've been there lots. But this was the place where we made our art and got our inspiration and had our, our support in Atlanta turned out to be the place. I mean, this is where our friends really like it, you know. So I, that's one of my main opinions about Atlanta. We, we come the closest here to doing whatever we really want. And do you still live in the same place over in West End? Yep. And Ronald died of cancer about nine years, in, in 2007. Uh, so I had to invent new life. I mean, we lived a kind of charmed life. As my daughter says, oh, you always came home and said, well, we were so good. We did such a great show. And I said, yeah, because we were so surprised that we got away with what we did. Every time we came home, we thought, how did we ever do that? How why did people let us do that? But uh, so since then, I returned to teaching acrobatics at this 
circus arts place in Decatur and got hooked up with this circus, which I worked with for, gosh, nine years. And at this moment, everything has sort of come apart, the circus people. What happens so often is that people would find each other in the circus, become couples, and go off doing their act together. And I can hardly complain because I did that too with my wife. I mean, we, but in a way, we're sort of in between, what do they call it? In between, um, what's wrong with, what do theater people say? In between, not appointments. Anyway, nothing much is happening at the mm -hmm. time. I'm trying to get a team together to do the Inman Park Parade. But it's really hot, it's really difficult there. You don't get paid for it, and even though I think it's incredibly much fun to do acrobatics in front of people on McLendon Avenue in the middle of the street, everybody doesn't think it is. So <laughs> I get two weeks to get that together, so the minute I leave here, I have to start, it's like a chess game, figuring out how to get these people to rehearse with each other. They will suddenly say, oh, I got another gig and I can't do it. And, I, and then I can't really say, I can't, I can't offer them better. I can't say, well, I'm going to pay you more. But I'm going to say, don't you want to further the art of acrobatics? And I can't say that either because, well, now we're back to the now, Andy. This is no more memories. We are. And I am telling you what is now happening to me. I, I want to gauge how you're feeling right now because I do want to go I'm dig. I'm tired. You're tired? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think with that that we should break for the day. But I did, I do have several questions about about the bird very specifically. Oh, well, ask and, me that. No, but, I can hold my, well, if it could be specific, I can, I can try to keep. But if you're tired and, and not just with you no. in, in interviewing in general. Would you be willing sometime in the next month, say, to come back for an hour and a half or two hours? <laughs> yes, no, right, I'm not ready to do that now. You're right. right. Yes, no, of course, I, I, I think it's important. I mean, I not only like to tell these stories, but I think it's really important to try to. I do too. And, the, and the, there's, I think that there's also a lot more that I'd like to hear about your and Roanoke's life in the 1980s, 90s, 2000s. Um, yeah, and I can show you some doing. of her books and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, no, that'd be fantastic. And I can even, I will be able to get you a copy. Of, I, mean, I have to do this. Procrastination is my big enemy now. Of one, one book was translated from Swedish that is about our life in the New York's Lower East Side. And it's really interesting. And I have a translation, all I gotta do is print it up and I can oh, I'd be really interested. give you a copy my, of that. One of my best friends gave me a copy and I'm, it's a two volume set of, and I forget who the author and I forget the title, but it's a book about Germans coming to live in New York City in the mm -hmm. 1960s. Like, that's interesting, yes. It so interesting. it sounds really like th these would be great companion pieces. Yes, I, it's bring, of course that immediately makes something click in my mind. I know some couple with a German wife, and I can't remember if it's here or it was in New York. Ronak's book, yes, that's right. Ronak's book is called Immigrant, and it's about Swedish women who have left Sweden for adventure. And she can go, the first woman she writes about is Saint Bridget, who left Sweden in the Middle Ages to go to Rome to tell the Pope what to do. And the pictures of her, Andy, are medieval pictures, you know, with this wimple stylized, I mean, it's, <laughs> It certainly isn't even close to a kind of real portrait. The next was 
Queen Christina, who in the 1600s or 1700s also gave up being queen to go to Rome for some reason. She then goes through women up to, well, it was Greta Garbo, Anita Eckberg, uh, in Ingrid Bergman. I mean, there have been many actresses up to a woman that lived in our building in New York who was the daughter of a Swedish army officer and had come to America and married a Black Panther. And these people lived in our building, the next floor down, and had two kids in whom we babysat now and then. And Rana, of course, spoke Swedish with this woman. And one early one morning, they weren't home, but I heard this terrible crash on the floor below. And I went down to see what had happened. And here was their apartment door smashed and closed, but you could see somebody had hit the door with a sledgehammer. I knocked on the door and said, what's going on, you know? And the door slowly opened, and what I recognized immediately is a police 38 revolver was pointed at me. And since the door was opening like this, it was in the person's left hand. And I said immediately, okay, it's okay, just a neighbor. The police were raiding him, as they did with all the black, they were going to arrest him, but he wasn't home. They had come and just smashed in the door at five in the morning, and uh, nobody was there. Uh, but they eventually caught him and put him in jail with all, the, you know, they killed him in Chicago. They shot Black Panthers. Yeah. She went back to Sweden. The children went to the father's mother in Newark. That always happened with these international things. So, and he was in jail for many years. I'm sure. His name was Curtis Powell. And he was a chemist. He taught chemistry somewhere. I mean, he was an unlikely, although maybe he was making bombs. I don't know. But a lot of things happened in our building, which he tells about in this book. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Somebody said, we said we didn't have a TV set in those days because it would just be stolen immediately. And we didn't have to, all we did is look out the window. Like somebody called us and said, do you know that their police, their policemen in, in bulletproof vests climbing up your fire escape? And we said, no, we hadn't noticed that. But here they were, you know. Uh, the guy in the next apartment to ours had somehow gotten, he was a ham radio operator, and had gotten connected with everybody's TV set and started to threaten people. He was obviously out of his mind, saying, if you go near my wife, you know, I'm going to kill you. And as people were sitting in their living rooms listening to TV, this voice of this guy suddenly appeared out of nowhere, that I'm going to come and kill yeah. you. You know, if you look at, uh, this was in our the apartment next yeah, yeah. to us. So as I looked out of the peephole, everybody at a peephole, into the hall, there were guys coming along the wall like this with bulletproof vests because his door was right adjacent to our door. Mm -hmm. This is it. And they were going to go in there, so I wasn't certainly going to go no. out. And, yeah. You know, and they had shotguns and they took him away. And we all thought, thank God, because he was really out of his mind. And the next day, Andy, he was back again. And we all thought, what? What happened? He, but he didn't do anything, you see. He hadn't really, he really hadn't threatened anybody personally, nor did he have a gun. It was not true. So here he was, and we all had to go back to, you know, normal life right. in our apartment. Hey, building. neighbor. Yeah, hi, Johnny. How you doing? <clears throat> okay. Yes, I'll come back. Well, very good. Well, thank you very well, much. I love this. This is so much I'm fun. Gonna, wrap it now but we will make a, make an appointment for the next next go round yeah.